beep. <laughs> you swine. <laughs> Ruining my excellent intro to be there. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I, I thought I was going to start us off this week because we've, we've been a couple of weeks gone. So I thought, yeah, that's enter true. with a phoebe. Yes, Phoebe. Um, right, hello everybody. I am uh, one of your co-hosts, Steve Hester, and this is Podywood, the show where we talk about movies with the people that make movies. And like my colleague has said, we are a few weeks late, and my colleague himself is here, and he is... Yeah, uh, I'm Andrew Roger Carson. I'm probably the reason why we're a couple of weeks late, to be honest. <laughs> I have been exceptionally busy since I got back from LA. I mean, come on, we've recorded like one episode. Yeah, since I got back, and I have been literally all over the place. So I do apologize to our listeners. Yeah. I apologize to you also, Steve. And to make up for it, I get you an interview that is going to last three effing weeks. Yes, that is true. We are going to be talking to the minds behind such wonderful films as uh, Kung Fu Panda, the Robin Hood movie that was eventually made by the bloke from Newcastle, and uh, also Tales from the Crypt, Demon Knight. But uh, but that will all be coming up later. Yes, uh, later on the show, uh, screenwriting and producing duo Cyrus Forrest and Ethan Reef will be with us on the show. And it was such an amazing episode. Mm. It stretched out over three episodes. So you actually get to uh, listen to kind of a, a major three-parter for once. For once. For, for once. Um, and see. Ah, I see. Yeah. On words. I see what you're doing there. I know. I'll <laughs> stop doing that so we can do the podcast, shall we? So, yes, it was John Carney's 2007 Irish independent film, Once. Yes, the, the movie which um, I think Bill Daly talked about on one of his earlier interviews. Um, I can't remember which one. It was probably one of the first Harry Potters that we uh, that we got him in for um but he did mention that uh and i think you mentioned it on the last episode that this was the movie which steven spielberg said reignited his love of cinema and uh gave him the belief in the art form once again uh so yes it is a story about a busker in dublin and a czechoslovakian immigrant uh they don't have any names they're just listed down in the credits as guy and girl uh, the play by Glenn Hansard and Marketa Ergolova, which hey, well done. which I hope I'm pronouncing that right. And the story is effectively it's a week of their friendship as they kind of come together and help each other over their heartbreaks of their previous love affairs and also start to make music of their own. And I do mean actual music. I don't use that as a euphemism. Uh <laughs> The, the two of them come together and uh, eventually start to hammer out ideas for songs and they go on to record an album and the whole movie is um and I think I think this is probably the best way to describe it and it's it's the two h's really this has to be one of the most honest and most human films I have seen in a very long time Yes. It is an affecting story insofar as it is a very realistic story. Nothing happens in terms of huge, grandiose moments. There is no kind of running through the airport, dodging security to tell your love uh, just before they get on the plane how much they mean to you. There are no grand romantic gestures apart from maybe one kind of at the end. Um, The two of them have great chemistry on screen but it's never really exploited it never goes crass or anything and there's even a couple of times during the movie where guy tries to invite girl to go back to his and she just knocks him knocks him back and that kind of thing feels real and the way that the two are emotionally connected not only with themselves but uh, some of the other supporting characters like um like guy's dad uh feels very very real very very grounded and there is a a wonderful human element to it all that we are all very very frail and we need someone out there in our lives to kind of pick us up and set us back on the path that we need to be and that comes across in spades it is stuffed from start to finish with original music which was written by the two leads themselves 
And it's actually quite telling that since I watched the movie, uh, I actually watched the movie Saturday, we're now recording this on the Monday, I then spent the next day or so listening to the the music from the film over and over again. So I think that's a pretty good indicator that uh, that they've actually got some decent tunes on there. Yes. It's full of some wonderful jokes, uh, some wonderful little humour, but yet again, everything is perfect for the characters it's perfect for the environment uh the very beginning he gets his case that's got all the money in because he's busking outside the shop he gets his case stolen and um and when the guy runs off he manages to catch up to him and the guy tells him off saying you know if you need money just ask for money there's no need to take it and then the guy turns around and says how's ma (laughs) and then you kind of oh right okay so that's his brother okay that makes sense um but yes, this has to be one of the the nicest films I've seen in a long, long while. It really it is. is. It's, it's a it's a very kind of inspirational movie, especially mm. for uh, filmmakers out there. Like you said, uh, Steven Spielberg absolutely loved this movie. Uh, Bob Dylan also fell in love with this movie as well, mm-hmm. uh, and he even invited the two cast members to come and play uh, as an opening act for one of his gigs, which. You know, that's got to be one of the greatest <laughs> yeah. indicators you can get. As I mentioned, this was directed by John Carney, uh, and this was his debut. This was his kind of first film, I believe, or it could have been Sing Street. I might be wrong. It was one of the two. Um, but yeah, I mean, this was filmed uh, really early on in his career before he went and did Begin Again with mm-hmm. Kira Knightley and Mark Ruffalo, which is a f- fantastic movie i love that movie it's uh, shot very guerrilla style as well well lots of the... long camera lenses and um and you, uh, realistic lighting using uh real lighting sources and so on there's there's very little oh, yeah which yeah. speaks of any kind of budget that's gone with yes it. that i mean this is no budget movie making mm. proving it's alive and well if you have the balls to go out and do it yeah even i want to go out and make a movie like this and this was filmed with long lenses. It was filmed without permits. <laughs> so a lot of stuff going on. No one had any idea what to do. Um, There's a wonderful and- moment about that. I'm going to let you carry on, but there is a wonderful moment about that where he's on the bus and he's singing a song about uh, his uh, his ex-girlfriend who cheated on him and now lives in London. And he sings this song about him being a was it vacuum cleaner sucker guy and then sings another one where he's uh, basically saying, fuck her. Grr, over again like a, like a heavy metal style and then just kind of looks at this old little, little old lady on the bus and says oh sorry love and then starts to sing it really quiet and there's a shot of the old lady laughing to herself and you get the feeling that that was an actual person who was on the bus that wasn't like an extra or someone that was just someone that happened to be on the bus that they were filming in who found it really amusing it's probably not it's probably like the, the director's grandmother or something but it just it just had that feel to it yeah, I mean, I will honestly go on to say that, I mean, this movie is the ultimate success story for a movie. Um, mm. And it's a shame that both of the actors, Glenn Hansard and the person you mentioned, I've forgotten the name. Marketa Irglova. Yeah, I just wanted to, get you to say it again. Uh, they've both vowed never to act again following this, and they're concentrating on music, mm. which is one of the greatest shames of this entire thing. But this was originally uh, planned to star Killian Murphy oh, right. in the Glenn Hansard role. And when apparently he was really nervous about acting against her, who had no acting experience, he pulled out of the project. And when he pulled out of the project, the money was pulled mm. as well. That's a shame because she comes across so naturalistic in the whole thing. They both yeah. did. And the thing is, this movie, I mean, it was shot in 17 days. Uh, all of the locations are basically the cast members' houses. <laughs> <laughs> the script was only 60 pages long, mm. and the outline for that script was written in five minutes in a cafe by John Carney one day because he was uh, missing his girlfriend, which is why it was what it was kind of based on. Yeah. And John Carney gave... Well, he practically put some of his own money into this film. Uh, the two actors, the two main actors, ended up getting what was his pay, so he worked for no money. And paid the two actors, and everyone who worked on the film got a back end shares uh, if the movie made any money. Uh, and this script had spent years, years in development with the Irish Film Board. Okay, and they'd had so many changeovers on the Irish Film Board. Bill could probably tell us more about that. But it was actually a lower level executive who turned around, and said to them, and 
look, if you can make this on £150,000, go and do it. Man, right? did it. Well, get this. Here are the facts. Ding, 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 ding. Just the facts, man. This movie lasted longer in the US box office than Spider-Man 3 and Shrek the 3rd did. Wow. This went on to earn... 23 million pounds against a hundred and fifty thousand oh. pound budget. Oh, if you were taking a back end deal on that, you would have been rubbing your hands. Oh, yeah. Add to that, a theater adaptation of this movie has gone on to win eight Tony Awards and been nominated for 11 other awards. This is the greatest success story. In independent cinema history. Yeah. Add to that, the song Falling Slowly, which is an incredible song, yep. wins the Academy Award for Best Song. Yeah. No, I could I can believe that. It's it's such it's such an earworm. It really does stick in your head afterwards. Exactly. This is the the perfect accompaniment to a movie like Before Sunrise. Mm. And it's that type of movie that can be just Immortal. And you were mentioning before about the uh, the scene where he steals his money. Mm -hmm. uh, apparently, be it it doesn't actually pay to not let all of the people know you are filming a movie because in one take when they did that, someone actually tripped the guy <laughs> up and attacked him for stealing the money. <laughs> and then they had to rush in and tell him, "No, no, it's for a film." But uh, that's that's the uh, the problem of uh, shooting. But but it's. It's an inspiring movie. You've got to watch it, it every is. now and again. Especially if you want to make movies. I mean, this goes to show you, you do not need all of the Hollywood glitz and glamour or the huge budgets to go and make yet another craze movie. No, you don't. You know, this kind of thing reaches an audience from being so authentic. I think the, the only time that um, it kind of breaks that feel is there's a moment where the girl goes to an off-license to get some batteries. And then she's coming out. She's got headphones on with the, with a discman. Do you remember them? Remember them? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Portable oh, CD God. players. Oh dear. And um, she's she's walking down the road and she's singing the song to it while she's listening to the beat on the headphones. And there's one final shot where there's uh, there's a crane shot which goes up from the street and it was that is, I think that's the only time in the movie that kind of movie making breaks in. Yeah, and you know that was the most expensive thing on the entire movie to pay for was that crane hire for a day. That doesn't surprise me. The thing is, you could make this film even cheaper now if you look at the the, the cameras that you get on iPhones now. And it, and who was it? Was it um, was it Steven Soderbergh that filmed oh, made yeah. a film on, a, on an iPhone? So you could do that using the tech that you've got in your pocket, but you need to have this wonderful human and heartwarming emotional story to go with that and this this just nailed that so wonderfully and perfectly yeah it was beautiful so yeah was it worthy of what's in the box for you oh totally totally absolutely it made your life better for seeing it it did do actually and it it um it achieved the the perfect thing where at the end um there was a little tear in my eye um because it doesn't kind of wrap up the way that you think it's going to but the way that it does makes perfect sense for everything that has gone on before there. The the only things which which did kind of uh, stick out to me as well, two last uh, observations, is the fact that Glenn Hansard, he's got a very kind of almost Cat Stevens way of uh, singing, or, or Yusuf Islam, as he's uh, now known. He's got that kind of wonderful, kind of slightly wavering voice which is absolutely wonderful. And the other thing is, is in the party scene, and they're all sat around and they're they're having they're having all kinds of drinks going on, and they all start singing and the, you know all these emotional songs. But all I could think of when I was watching that was a Billy Connolly sketch that he did. Oh, yes. I say, oh, Sydney, I love you. It was it was that. I all I could think of was that throughout that entire scene. Oh. Genius. But no, it was a wonderful film, absolutely heartwarming, life affirming, and a brilliant example of what you can do if you don't have any money in filmmaking. As long as you've got a good script, good core concept, and the right people in to do it justice, you can make a film with nothing in your pocket. Exactly. So sometimes, you know, 
actors and other people who work on movie just need to go and take that chance, mm. you know, and, and actually involve themselves. And for you people who are interested in seeing it, you can actually watch it on Netflix. It is on yes. Netflix at the moment. So do yourself a favor. Choose that as your Saturday night movie. Watch yes. it. Really Although, enjoy. considering that Netflix seems to be hemorrhaging money and, and uh, stock shares at the moment, might not be yes. on there for too much longer. <laughs> uh, are you kidding? They're going to use that as a benchmark for all of the rest of their films now that they've got no money. Yeah. So, so yes. Uh, once there you go. It's uh, it's a great recommendation. Really is. And yeah. uh, we've got a bit of a mixed bag for our anniversaries this week. <laughs> Watch them again all of the time Or we get them on Prime for free But we only know how old they are When we learn their anniversary Yeah, we're away for, what, like about three weeks and we still haven't changed that bloody music? <laughs> I must chase Neil, our music yeah. man, for something new. I think going with a bit of electro pop. Yeah. Tainted love style, that do. Yeah. So, what no. do we have? Well, uh, we have four this week, and mm. I'm sure there's one of them you're going to spend a good 20 minutes on alone. Okay. So you'll have to contain yourself, Steve. All right. But more on that one in a bit, because this week in 2001, a number you don't like, obviously, This, <laughs> but in 2001 <laughs> around this week, a movie called Driven was released oh that was stallone's comeback vehicle pardon the pun yeah. yes well driven um in a way it kind of achieved that, but uh it also achieved a lot of other things as well yeah it got people talking about him again but for all the wrong reasons oh yes well here's a little bit of research stats for you for one yeah that'd be good we need to get a little bit of music on that we do for one this was directed by uh, the basically <laughs> the motion picture Libra scale himself, Rennie Harlan. Either he gets it absolutely brilliant or catastrophically wrong. Mm. For every cliffhanger, which is awesome, there's a cutthroat island which killed Karolko. For every long kiss goodnight, there is oh, the legend of Hercules. Don't, 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 don't track it down. Honestly, just please don't. So, yes, uh, it was directed by Rennie Harlan. And uh, the sad thing about this is Stallone actually lists this movie as one he wishes he had not done, which is quite something when you have Stop and My Mum Will Shoot on your resume. Mm. You know, I don't think actually Driven is as bad as people think. Now, have a look at this. Originally, way back when, Stallone was trying to do a biopic of Ayrton Senna. Right. But somehow... In the process, when that project didn't initially get picked up, it transformed into this. Now, this project was done by franchise pitchers, and there's going to be more on them <laughs> later on this season. Trust me. Try an entire show. Uh, franchise pitchers was uh, a company uh, run by someone who had a chain of laundrettes. And basically, he found a way to finance Star's dream vehicles, Step Forward, Battlefield Earth. More he wasn't doing any money laundering, was he? <laughs> yeah. That was a we'll joke, please don't say. We'll find out in a couple of weeks. Um, so this was a project that Stallone wanted to do. And originally they had done some forays into action. I think they did a movie with Stallone called Avenging Angelo. I think they also did his Get Carter remake. Ooh. So... Yeah, so the writing was kind of obviously on the wall at this point. Uh, they'd done Wesley Snipes' movie The Art of War, which pre did pretty well, I think, actually. Um, and then there was this. And the first cut of this movie was apparently four hours long. Wow. And if you're interested, 51 minutes of those edited-out minutes to make it a two-hour movie are on the deleted scenes on the actual DVD. <laughs> so you've practically got a TV pilot wow. of cut scenes. If that doesn't highlight that this was a star vehicle, no, we're just going to shoot exactly what we want. That's like more than The Godfather. That that's is more than so The Godfather bloated. Part 2. You know, that's almost like watching a real Le Mans race. You know, uh, But for your money, uh, you've got a pretty impressive ensemble cast there, because apart from... Uh, Stallone, you had Till Schwager, 
<laughs> which is an awesome name to say and an awesome guy to show up in movies like Inglorious Bastards and um, The Replacement Killers, one of my guilty pleasures. <laughs> but yeah, he was he was a pretty big German star and then ended up going on to star in the Uwe Ball for movies. So yeah. Then you had Burt Reynolds. Good old Burt Reynolds, who does the entire movie from a wheelchair. And this was one moment in Driven where he showed more genuine acting and emotion than you've seen Burt Reynolds do in decades. So it's worthy seeing on that. Plus you've got Gina Gershon, you've got Robert Sean Leonard. You know, it's kitted out with a whole bunch of people and unfortunately Estella Warren as well. Uh, more on that in a minute. Now Driven... Stallone got the idea of doing this film whilst making Judge Dredd. That's a hell of a leap, isn't it? Yes, From... and it's also no suitable environment for coming up with an idea. No. <laughs> the movie, the Judge Dredd movie is something that screams out uh, studio interference, if ever I have seen one. Yeah, thank God for the Carl Urban version. Yes. Now, with Driven, it took four years to finance the movie, and obviously in Steps franchise pictures... And, uh, you know, it's it's Stallone's idea for his comeback, which wasn't such a bad thing. The only bad thing about it is the fact that it had a 72 million budget. Okay, not bad for the time. It made 32 million. Oh, no, that's not good. Now, franchise pitchers have a bit of a notorious history, which the FBI ended up getting involved with, where they would actually inflate their budgets... Mm. Uh, so that basically the first people who would come in and invest money uh, were thinking that they were putting towards and it was actually the entire budget. That is what I believe. We are going to get more on that story. I've heard conflicting kind of stories on it, but some of them have said the exact same thing. Now, this, uh, this was Rennie Harlan's first flop since Cutthroat Island. So you can imagine having Cutthroat Island and then having some success with... Uh, the Long Kiss Goodnight and Deep Blue Sea, and then having driven. Okay, which it, it's it's not good for him. But it, for Stallone, this was actually his first number one movie since Copland, which was about three or four years earlier. And a great movie as well. It was a big risk for him that didn't pay off as much as he thought. Was it as but good yeah. as Oscar? That's all I want. <laughs> no, I actually have a soft spot for Oscar. So do I. <laughs> I do. It's so now, cheesy. If you watch this movie incredibly carefully, for some unknown reason, when Sylvester Stallone finally... Uh, it does like the Days of Thunder thing, where he's kind of doing a racing version of Robert Duvall in Days of Thunder. right? But he's actually coming back to race. So he's been brought back in for it. Now, when he walks into the pit lane, a very bizarre thing happens. If you're very careful, you can spot Dustin Hoffman in racing gear saying hello to him. Okay. In one of the most random things ever. And it's like, you know, that spotting Daniel Craig in The Force Awakens. You know, it's, it's like an urban myth, but it is actually true. Well, no, the Daniel weird. Craig in The Force Awakens, that is a true one as well. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, the movie, um, unfortunately, it kind of killed off Estella Warren's acting career. Uh, she was actually kind of going places, but... She is kind of the weakest thing in this with kind of Stallone and I guess parts of Burt Reynolds. They didn't actually deliver the goods on it either. But um, the soundtrack is amazing on this movie. Absolutely amazing. You've got the Chemical Brothers. You've got all sorts in there. And it is a really pumping movie. The race scenes are really well done. But there's there's way too many characters in there. And it's it's what I call a velocity movie that used to come out. You know, like Fast and the Furious mm. and another one called Talk. And Biker Boys, they had all of these vehicle movies that came out. That he just tends to rely on speed yeah, to, to try yeah. and make things exciting. Is that what you mean? And, and I've got to admit, this is one adrenaline-pumping movie. Uh, for all of its faults, it does have some amazing, amazing race sequences in it. Much better than the video game that came out. Yeah, I was going to I was gonna bring that up. I remember that game. Uh, I never played it, but I do remember just seeing it everywhere around about the time. Usually in the the kind of like the bargain discounted area yeah. of the the store. I think it was on, I think it was on like the the PS2, Xbox, and GameCube at the time. Uh, but for some reason, it was the GameCube one that I used to see the most. Yes, exactly. No idea um, why. 
But um, I, I think it was just a random Formula One game that had been developed that had not been able to get sold, and they just tacked the movie title on it. Yeah, it's, just, it's amazing how many times that has happened. Just get a digitised Stallone face. And just, actually, having said that, though, I'm reminded of the cover. The it, It's like an image of Stallone with a helmet on, and you can kind of see his face through the helmet. It looks so badly photoshopped. Yeah. It looked awful, so it could very well be that that was an existing image that they just decided to just lump his face onto. Exactly. And make more sense. So yeah, I mean, Driven was released in 2001. Uh, personally, uh, it's a guilty pleasure for me. I actually do enjoy it. Mm. Um, and if it's on, and it's very rare that it's on, but if I do see it on, or I see it on a streamer, I'm like, I can put this on the background and just really switch off with it. You know, and I can see what they were doing with it. It's not a movie that's had a lot of studio interference or anything. It actually does tell the story, and the characters are actually fully rounded. And, you know, the action is good. It's just, it's not considered a, a great movie. It's just one of those kind of Stallone movies where he's trying to find his way back to Rocky Balboa. You know, and he's, he's just flauntering in all of these different roles. Well, you know, but I'm glad he did find his way back. I've got a soft, yeah. I've got a soft spot for Sly. I've got a soft spot for Sly. You know, every one of his movies, he has to have his fortune cookie wisdom moment. Mm. Where he, where he gives these ideas. And I think he's an amazing character with amazing stories. So, uh, Driven, I'm actually going to put that on the cult shelf. Yeah. And say, it is worth delving into and watching. You know, okay. just don't expect it to be um, Le Mans of Grand Prix or any of these fantastic racing movies that have come out over the years. All right, well, that's the, the first one. But we've got three more. So, what do we have for your next offering Okay, well, we're going back 25 years here. And uh, it's a shame because we really could have covered this arc if we were doing every single week, and my apologies that we're not. So we're kind of coming in at the back end of this. But um, And I know you're going to want to wax lyrical about this for quite a while, but we're going to try and keep it on track here. But 25 years ago this week, Return of the Jedi Special Edition was released into cinemas. Okay. Okay, Okay, right. So... As you know, uh, directed by... Uh, Richard Marquand. Yay! You're the one person who knows. So <laughs> Yeah, Welsh director, because he wanted to get yes. Steven Spielberg in, but there was issues with the uh, with the, the union, because he ended up quitting the union after uh, making Empire Strikes Back, because they were insisting about the uh, credits being at the beginning, and Lucas was saying, yes. no, 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 I want the opening crawl. So he left the, the union, so he couldn't get anyone that was part of the Director's Guild, which but, meant Spielberg honest, was out. You know, Richard Marquand, uh, he went on to also direct Jagged Edge, mm-hmm. starring Glenn Close and Jeff Bridges, and he was also the writer of a movie I mentioned the other week, uh, one of Van Damme's better movies, Nowhere to Run, right? that was directed by Robert Harmon. Okay. Who everyone knows that I am a fan of. Yeah. Now, the special edition didn't make as many changes as the New Hope special edition. Um, slightly more than the Empire one. Slightly more than the Empire. Yeah. How do you feel about Hayden Christian as a Force ghost? Um, I f***ing hate it. <laughs> no, <laughs> I, I, knew do, I do. I do. I remember I got the DVD box set. When it, uh, when it first came out, it was after my 25th birthday, and I was so hungover. I was, I was like a two-day hangover. I was rotten. I'd broken my glasses. I'd been sick everywhere during the night, and I turned up for the opening, and I, there's a friend of mine there, and he's there in like a black leather jacket and a polo neck looking like some kind of Parisian artist or something. You know, he's a smoking a, a smoking a galois. Oh, yeah. And then I turn up in a Green Day hoodie, like... <laughs> Skate shorts, which were well out of style by then, looking like the ultimate super nerd. Oh yes, oh yes. And I, I got, I got the uh, the discs home, and I watched it through, and I got right up to the end of Return of the Jedi, and I noticed all the little changes that done. Okay, right there's Coruscant. Okay, all right, fine. Uh, I miss Yub Nub, but no, I can see what they're doing. Who? Wait, who the? Wh- who? What? 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 So doesn't Hayden Christensen look so uncomfortable like he has no he, idea what he's doing he standing looks there. like he looks like a schoolboy that's getting his photo taken for the for like the yearbook and the thing is it doesn't make any sense because people say oh no he went back to his good form as he was before it's like no he was saved by Luke which means that because he was saved by Luke he then went back over to the light side as an old man 
that is the person that Luke recognises. He doesn't recognise this 12-year-old boy that stood in front of him wearing his dad's pyjamas. Now, I've got no problem about Hayden Christensen in the in the prequels. I've seen him act in a few things, and you get the feeling that he was just let down by a terrible script and bad direction. Yeah. I don't uh, think he's the best actor in the world. Everybody looked but... terrible in that movie. Yeah. Samuel L. Jackson even delivered terribly. Oh, no one came out of that one smelling of roses. Uh, so I think a lot of the hate that went towards Hayden Christensen was unfounded. But I don't think that he deserved to be in this whatsoever. It doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, other little factoids here that I have pulled up, and I didn't know if you knew about them or not. Mm -hmm. Did you know that the Wilhelm Scream guy is actually in the movie? Oh, uh, what, Ben Burt? Yes. Is it Ben Burt? No, Ben Burt was the guy who did the sound... The, the yeah. actual guy who originated the Wilhelm scream, right? Oh, the, the one who's actually voiced. Right. When the guy gets uh, the guard gets the battery thrown at him and he goes over the railing, mm -hmm. that is the actual guy who originated that scream. Oh, I wonder and if they yes, did that on he does purpose. It. Well, quite possibly. Quite possibly. <laughs> Maybe he's not union. <laughs> <laughs> Could be. Other things to notice here: the infamous. Meme inspiring Admiral Akbar, it's a trap. It's a trap. Yes, was actually changed in post because originally it was read out as it's a trick. Mm -mm. No, a trap so, sounds better. Yes. I also didn't know until doing my research today that uh, the composer, John Williams, God to many. Definitely. Did you know that his son was the lead singer of Toto? Oh, no, I did not. And did you know that lead singer of Toto actually composed the Ewok song for the movie? Oh, he was probably pissed off when it got pulled for this version. Yeah. Oh, yes, I can imagine. Yeah. So, so that infamous Nub Nub song or whatever it yeah. was. Well, speaking that... of songs, the one song which everyone gets upset about is the, the song Routine in Jabba's Palace. Which... Oh, Sly Snoodles. Sly Snoodles. It, yet again, there's a prime example of the CG not living up to where the puppets were. The puppets look far better. Just keep keep that whole section. You didn't need to mess around with it. Um, although I do know that the actress who plays the, the Twi'lek girl that gets dropped into the, the Sarlacc pit... Femi she, Taylor. Yeah. Femi Taylor. She came back after, what was it, like about 15 years by that point? Yeah, and looked exactly the same. And looked exactly the same. So yeah, She was actually the only cast member to return Yeah. Uh, for that special edition. Uh, that's a movie where Gary Kurtz didn't even return. No. <laughs> Poor Gary. You, you make the two greatest Star Wars movies and then you get fired. Just get fired because a lot of the blame of The Empire Strikes Back, which I don't honestly see. But, well, I think it was mainly because it went majorly over budget and over it schedule. Did. It did. I think it went about like about 15, maybe $20 million over budget. Yeah. Uh, not that he didn't make it back, mm. but... You know, Gary Kurtz was the guy that suffered for that, and yeah. he was given the boot. So, uh, poor Gary. And uh, speaking of Ben Burt, who you mentioned before, uh, he was the sound designer for Return of the Jedi. Mm -hmm. And I never would have thought in a million years that the slithery noises of Jabba was actually made by putting his hands in a cheese casserole. Yeah. Yeah, I, I love I love all that kind of foley work and... Uh, I actually really adore all the stuff that goes on behind the scenes on movies, set design and the construction and prop design and all the rest of it. Um, but it's things like that. It's those wonderful, wonderful ethereal moments like the sound design, which you think, oh, it's this, that and the other. And then it turns out to be something completely different. Like you can get the sound of troops walking by just getting like a leather jacket and just rhythmically dropping it onto a table. You know what? I actually want to get a sound designer on our show. So do I. On a big movie. I, I think that is just an amazing thing. Mm. Finding out what movies they worked on and letting us know exactly what those sounds were. Yeah. Um, also, well, what could have been, right? Alan Rickman auditioned for this movie. Playing who? Do you know the guy who greets Darth Vader at the beginning? Oh, yes. Uh, I can't remember his character name. So it's, uh, he asks too much. We need more men. You ask too much. We need more men. <laughs> I'm sorry, that would have been brilliant. We shall double our efforts. That would have been uh, that would have been incredible. Yeah, yeah, apparently he auditioned for it, didn't get it. George 
Lucas obviously knows nothing. The Death Star was a lot bigger as well, mm-hmm. uh, unfinished. I do want to know about the workers who maybe took the weekend off and decided to come back to work to the Death Star <laughs> on a Monday and figure out that, like, shit. I'm out of work. Yeah. <laughs> I left my tool bag in there. Uh, there, is a, there is a brilliant, there's loads of brilliant sketches, actually. Um, but the, the series Robot Chicken... Of course, yeah. did loads of parodies of this, and one of the best one is uh, with with you've got Luke Vader and the Emperor in the throne room, but you can't hear anything because you just hear like the hammering and the clattering and the drilling as the construction team are putting the Death Star together. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let's let's look at this here. Although some people often used to view it as the weakest in the original trilogy. Mm-hmm. Uh, like the two before it, it is preserved in the National Film Registry. Mm-hmm. And it also holds two Guinness World Records, Steve. Which one? One, it holds the Guinness World Record for the highest box office gross for a screenwriter, being George Lucas. Okay. Because he was classed as a screenwriter, so he actually holds the record, the world record for the highest box office gross on this movie. And also, this movie has a Guinness record for the biggest opening weekend for a re-released movie. Right. Which means the special edition. Yes. So this actually holds the record more than A New Hope or The Empire Strikes Back. Wow. Which is bizarre. Yeah. Because I genuinely would have thought one of the other two would have had that accolade more. But the thing to really take away from Return of the Jedi, I mean, this was the cusp of visual effects before everything went CGI and shit with Star Wars. Um, Yeah. This was true craft of visual effects at work in this franchise. You know, they had the budget for it. They went everywhere with it. You know, it's one of the most impressive things to see in its original version. If if you do not Mm. see the special editions and locate and find those original versions. I've got them. Oh, yeah. Every, Every true fan should have them. Yeah. You know, they were still amazing to look at oh know, it's phenomenal and... i mean i think there's only there's a few moments where um you can see for example the uh the matting or whatever it was that, oh, yeah, that yeah. they used with the um with the ships during the the attack on the second death star which oh. i just think it's a phenomenal third act oh incredible it's a third act wonderfully three... paced <laughs> it's a third act with three acts yeah <laughs> just... and it also <laughs> has uh, arguably the best lightsaber fight out of all of the Star Wars films because yes. of the emotional weight that's behind it. But I will just say this. That scene, I remember seeing it. Darth Vader picks up the Emperor, throws him over into the pit. It was like the most goosebump moment as a kid. Mm-hmm. When I saw it, I didn't know it was coming. And when it happened, it was just incredible. It was so effective. And it's been cheapened by the fact that the emperor came back for rise of skywalker somehow palpatine returned any kind of shits that oscar isaac had about this franchise just went completely out the window when he had to say that line (laughs) you could tell part of his soul died on that day's worth of duty oh yeah i i reckon the emperor gets thrown down and as he's like falling and he's doing his scream and stuff like that and then suddenly he spots hans gruber Alan Rickman himself falling next to him. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That was Alan Rickman's audition. Yeah. Um, so Return of the Jedi, special edition, 25 years ago this week. Okay, so what do we have next? Okay, can you believe, Steve? Ooh. 30 years ago this week, a movie by the name of The Hand That Rocks the Cradle was released. Oh, now I haven't seen it, but I do remember it was infamous at the time, particularly in the UK, because it was also a... Uh, there was a real-life incident, and I think there was also a secondary storyline that was going on on a soap opera in the UK called Coronation Street that was very, very similar to it. <laughs> you just had right? to bring a Coronation Street reference in. <laughs> no, I just... I, I remember, because it was... Uh, it was it was it Sally and Kevin, I think had uh, had a baby and then they ended up getting a nanny and then the nanny just went psycho. Yeah, I think our American audience have absolutely no idea. That that episode's probably airing over there in three weeks. Yeah, probably. Yes. Uh, directed by uh, the late Curtis Hansen. Mm-hmm. Uh, amazing, incredible director behind such movies as LA Confidential, uh, which I watched the other week. Well, actually, I watched last week. 
uh, In Her Shoes, which <laughs> bizarrely I also watched again last week, and uh, Eight Mile, which I didn't watch last week. But he was uh, an absolutely amazing director. And uh, this is the kind of movie... Uh, well, basically, this is what happened to Rebecca de Mornay when she lost the role of Tinkerbell to Julia Roberts. Oh, in Hook? Yes. Yeah. Because Rebecca de Mornay was dead set on getting that role, and then Julia Roberts comes in and obviously get kicked out. But I think the cast of Hook would probably have preferred Rebecca de Mornay, from what I gather. Oh, they definitely would have. But to be honest, Rebecca de Mornay uh, got a nice bit of revenge because... Hand That Rocks the Cradle made $140 million worldwide. And not only that, it kicked Hook to number two. Mm. Eat that, Tinker Hell. Some people label this as an anti-feminist movie, and those people really should just shut the f*** up and watch a movie. It's not an anti-feminist movie at all. It was actually a movie with two strong female leads, Rebecca de Mornay and Annabelle Ciora, who ended up actually switching roles because uh, originally they were going for the opposite roles, and they oh, decided right. to switch them. And it made Rebecca de Mornay a household name. Yes. She was she exploded huge, you know, just like Sharon Stone, I guess, in the, in the same period. And also in this movie, you've got uh, Julianne Moore. She had a very early role in this movie. Uh, the young girl, uh, Madeline Zima, uh, she was great in the movie. You, only, you even had Ernie Hudson, who was in... Everything those Yay, days. Hey, Ernie Hudson. Ernie Hudson. Congo, anyone? Yeah. He, t- <laughs> apart from um, a little bit of grey hair and some obvious, you know, bit of bit of waistline going on, he looked more or less exactly the same in in Ghostbusters Afterlife that he did way back here when he did uh, Ghostbusters Two. The man <laughs> has not aged at all. <laughs> My favourite Ernie Hudson moment. It's got to be Congo. It's, it's the oh, movies. with that appalling accent that he's got throughout the whole thing. The appalling English accent he has through the entire movie. Yeah. Um, but I happen to be black. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's him and Tim Curry save that entire movie. Oh, yeah. Stop eating my sesame cake. Um, but yeah, uh, this also had a role for uh, John John Lancey, who played Q in oh, Star Trek The Next Oh, John Generation. Delancey. John Delancey. Yes. John Delancey. That, that's the one. And the movie was really big. I was surprised at how big the movie actually was mm. um, when it got released. You know, but making $140 million, you know, making a household name and to kick Steven Spielberg off the number one spot, that's nothing to be scoffed at. No, certainly not. But there is something to be scoffed at, Steve. Ooh, is it cake? I like cake. It, it's not sesame cake. It is the fact that in 1998 this week... The year where the blockbusters went to die, <laughs> Deep Impact was released. Oh, <laughs> oh, we've been waiting for this. Oh, right. Hey. I haven't actually seen Deep Impact. Haven't you? No, I've seen oh. Armageddon to death, but not Deep Impact. Okay, well, Deep Impact was Armageddon, but for grown-ups, yeah. I guess. It was really the, the kind of dramatic side, which, to be honest, I mean, it was directed by uh, Mimi Leder who was uh, she's a, a woman director who directed a lot of ER. So naturally it had the odd cameo from an ER actress in there. She'd kind of dipped her toes into first feature directing the year before with what I think is a very underrated movie called The Peacemaker, mm-hmm. starring George Clooney and Nicole Kidman. And I actually really liked that movie um, because I really liked George Clooney at the time when he was like struggling just to find his major role before Batman pretty much made everyone question if he was the right person in Hollywood. Uh, But she also uh, directed On the Basis of Sex, which came out a couple of years ago. And at the moment, she is a producer on the Morning Show series that is currently doing the rounds. That's the one with Jennifer Aniston, I believe. Uh, Is that on Apple TV Plus? I think it's Apple TV show, yeah. So she's one of the producers on that. And obviously, this is the story of uh, the huge meteorite uh, it's coming to Earth to wipe us out. Sound familiar? Oh, yes. Michael Bay's doing it in a couple of months after yes. this. Um, but there were some things about this when I watched this again this week that really kind of struck me. For one, I never realized there's a scene where Taylor Leone... Uh, well, Morgan Freeman plays the president. Of okay? course. The first black president in movie history, I think. I can't remember if it's ever done before that. But... Uh, 
there's a scene where he meets Taylor Leone, who's a reporter, and it's in a kitchen of a hotel, and it was the Ambassador Hotel that is no longer there anymore. Was was that the one where um, uh, Robert Kennedy was? Yes, the very kitchen yeah. where Bobby Kennedy was shot in, and it was like, oh, that feels a bit eerie. Yeah. I mean, the Ambassador's no longer there anymore. Apparently, it's just a huge patch of land that's been demolished. But the amount of movies that have been filmed at the Ambassador over the years uh, is really impressive. Uh, but getting back to Morgan Freeman as a president, apparently, when it was mooted for Morgan Freeman to be the president by Mimi Ledher, who actually requested him, uh, <laughs> apparently, uh, studio executives at DreamWorks said, you can't have Morgan Freeman play the president as it's not a science fiction movie. No one's going to believe a black president. And uh, I guarantee you that exec is probably producing something like Doc McStuffins or something to this day. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, we ended up getting Obama in like 10 years later. Yeah. You know. Uh, and how's this for the most luckiest marketing in the world? Days before the release of this movie, if you remember, in 1998... Astronomers said that the asteroid would collide with the Earth in 2028. Right? It was a very big story at the time. Apparently, this made the ticket sales for this movie boosted like crazy. And then, uh, not long after release, those same scientists were like, oh yeah, it's actually going to miss us by about 600,000 miles. <laughs> but, <laughs> Which is, in celestial terms, re still really close, but it's a swing and a miss, really. Isn't yes, it? exactly. You know, it's, it's how many miles Tom Cruise has travelled to actually make that Mission Impossible movie. How crazy is it uh, that you have this scene towards the end where New York, and it's always New York, goes gets obliterated by either alien invasions or tornadoes or anything. In this case, it's a giant tsunami. Now, after the wave hits and starts to settle and all of New York is underwater... The only thing that is showing in New York is the Twin Towers. Oh, no, that's a horrible piece of irony right there. Yes, it yeah. is. And there's people standing like on top of it and stuff, and just the water is all kind of around mm. it. And AI did kind of the same thing, the Steven Spielberg movie. Uh, so, yeah, that was, uh, that was a bit bizarre. It's also bizarre that Do Gray Scott is in this movie and does absolutely nothing. He's just like an extra in the room. <laughs> he basically is just there. He has no dialogue or anything. But apparently there's, there's word that a lot of his stuff ended up getting cut out, which is the same for um, Elijah Wood. Elijah Wood apparently had a lot more stuff in that movie and half of his scenes were axed as well. Yeah. Uh, for reasons we, we just do not know. He was probably um, getting ready to go off to Mount Doom. Probably. But, I mean, this was the summer of misses for blockbusters. And so much so that Taya Leone, the only woman to underact a tidal wave coming at her, lost her Worst Actress nomination to Lacey Chabert for Lost in Space. Itself, not a great movie oh, released that year. She was originally down as Meg in Family Guy. Was she? Yeah. I think oh, she did right. like the first two series and then uh, Mila Kunis took over. Oh, that's interesting. I yeah. didn't know that. Deep Impact lost the uh, Worst Script Award to that year's Godzilla movie by Roland Emmerich. Uh, uh, I, yeah. Th yeah, that one is actually a little bit of a guilty pleasure of mine, that one. It, it's, it's a guilty pleasure yeah. for me as well until the shoot the chandelier scene happens. Yeah. Uh, and... It's not even the most successful Meteor movie of that year. <laughs> because Michael Bay comes along with Armageddon and saves blockbusters for the entire year by having probably the best blockbuster. You had everything from Godzilla, um, the horrible Avengers movie. With... Oh, that was awful. Oh, oh. I'm sure Bill has a million stories on that one. Um, but the good things about Deep Impact... One, it has a great James Horner score. You also have Robert Duvall being Robert Duvall. You know, always dependable Robert Duvall oh, will yes. come in and do his, like, wizened old man with the infectious chuckle. Uh, you have Morgan Freeman, Elijah Wood's good in it. Uh, the always amazing Vanessa Redgrave mm -hmm. is in the movie as well. And 
a funny thing that I picked up on was the fact that you had two asteroid movies that year. One of the astronauts in Armageddon is Ben Affleck. No surprise there. And in Deep Impact as one of the asteroids, you get John Favreau. As one of the asteroids. (laughs) John Favreau as one of the asteroids. (laughs) As one of the asteroids, yes. He wasn't that fat, come on. No, no, no. No, as one of the astronauts. So when you look at that, you've got, okay, you have Daredevil and Foggy Nelson appearing Mm -hmm. as astronauts. So, yeah, as that's a Daredevil reference for people who remember that there was a Daredevil movie prior to the incredible series that came out on Netflix slash now Disney Plus. Which, if you haven't watched, you need to watch that. It is phenomenal. Yeah, I still haven't watched the third season yet. I'm, I'm just, I'm so behind. But um, yeah, uh, Deep Impact 1998 was released this week. And that is the anniversaries Mm. for this week. Well, for Mixed Bag, uh, mostly good, um, but uh, bookended with some kind of questionable stuff. But ultimately, it's uh, it's four films that are probably worth seeing. Yeah, yeah, I'll give that. Yeah, well, I guess it's guest time. Well, as we have a return to having guests on our show after a month break, we decided, why not invite two? Even better, they're a writing-producing partnership that has been together since the late 80s and have been behind some of the most recognisable movies and shows, such as Kung Fu Panda. Skadoosh. <laughs> Tales. <laughs> God damn you. I was on a flow. Tales from the Crypt, Demon Knight, uh, what became Ridley Scott's Robin Hood, Bulletproof Monk, and many others. And sometimes when we learn of partnerships, there's always a straight man and a wild card. It's kind of been the formula for as long as moving images have been around. <laughs> you know, you can have Martin and Lewis, Simpson, Bruckheimer, Peanut Butter and Jelly. It, it's going to be interesting to hear if it falls into the realm of writing teams also. So it's our pleasure to introduce, uh, from Los Angeles, of course, Cyrus Voris and Ethan Reef. Good morning, guys. How are we? Good hey, morning, Andrew. Good morning. Well, We're this good, is going thanks. to be a, a pretty interesting show, seeing as though it's incredibly dark and late here, and yeah, a bit of breezy, and we can guarantee you've got better weather than we have. Yeah, uh, wait, did you I, say good? You said good morning, guys, and it's yeah, afternoon it's not, where we are, yeah. and nighttime where you are. So, I don't but it is morning you, someplace. Andrew, yeah, it's so, someplace. Yes, somewhere well, around the world, someone's waking up somewhere. right now. <laughs> for the majority. Except us for the people who are listening to this is probably listening to it in the morning. So let's yes. let's suspend. Oh, the, oh okay. So we'll go with that. All right. That sounds that's like good. A, you but... value you you value the listeners, your audience. Yeah. That's great. That's a dubious yeah. but but possible theory. So we'll go with that, Andrew. Yes, we we value the audience. Otherwise, we'd have to get real jobs. Yeah, <laughs> nobody wants that, <laughs> especially not me. God forbid. <laughs> Well, uh, as we start out here, uh, well, naturally your careers started out individually at first. You were both undergrads at uh, NYU's Tisch School of Arts. So when did you guys first originally meet? Um, It's interesting. I mean, I'll answer that specific question in a moment. But the truth is, our careers as screenwriters and feature screenwriters and then TV writer producers executive producers showrunners there's like a gobbledygook you know multiple uh terms i guess for what we do in television whatever um we have we had minimal minimal barely minimal individual successes as writers separately but we didn't really have much of that apart from after we became partners as writers so yes, we did start out. Cy did certain things on his own and and made a living in the sort of film industry in New York, whatever film and television industry in New York. And I sort of I did also maybe at a slightly lower level than he was at, whatever. But we didn't really have any significant commercial success, professional success as writers until after we teamed up and started working together so yeah by um, the way it's but, it's six it's six twenty one a.m in seoul korea <laughs> just so you know in seoul that's who's listening to this in the morning uh yeah, yeah. I, I let me jump in and just say that uh, i think what ethan's leading to we we uh yeah we did some oddball stuff uh you know separately and we actually met uh we were both at nyu film school but not 
we didn't know each other in film school. We actually uh, had e Ethan and I were a year apart, so we weren't in any of the same classes. But we had a mutual friend who I actually worked with at the uh, NYU Student Copy Center, which is where you made piles of Xerox copies for disgruntled students all the time and occasional faculty and teachers. Um, and and a guy I worked with there was actually in Ethan's a bunch of Ethan's classes. And didn't we meet at a, a, a graduation party or yes, something? Yes, we either? met at that guy. That guy's name was Michael Wolstadt, and he was a classmate of mine all through uh, films. My four years of uh, film school, and he and like Sai just mentioned, he was a workmate. A, yeah, a work. Yeah, a coworker of size. And he threw a graduation party when the class that he and I belonged to was about to graduate. And I got invited to the graduation party and Cy got invited to the graduation party. And that's so Cy had already left film school, I guess, like one year before and was yeah. working mm -hmm. out in the in the big world. But that party is where he and I met and we we talked and it's kind of hard to believe, I think, in 2022. But at the time, we were the only two people we sort of knew once we started talking who were interested in writing traditional Hollywood feature screenplays from the NYU film program. There was a separate there was like a separate department for screenwriting. Um, and in the 80s. NYU was still very much uh, experimental, documentary, avant-garde film uh, school. And Sai and I both went to school there, and I think we both learned some valuable lessons there about, you know, cinema, filmmaking, movies, whatever. But both of us, like the cornerstone of our, of our creative souls was traditional Hollywood feature movies. And so we kind of like, we're excited to talk to each other because that was not like such a common thing at the time and with the circle of people we knew from school. And we were both close to finishing our first feature screenplays. Size, the first one that Sai wrote and me, the first one I had written. And we sort of made a deal. We exchanged like phone numbers, or whatever. And we said, Oh, when, when we, when you finish, let's trade scripts and we can read each other's scripts and, you know, give each other feedback or notes or whatever. And so we did that. And I, I, when we, when we got together again later on to, which was at a, scripts, I believe at a Ethan at a Mets Reds game, we got tickets to go to this Mets game and trade scripts. So we would watch a New York team and a, and a Cincinnati team, you know, beat on each other and exchange screenplays. Yeah, so we were reading each other's screenplays and giving each other feedback and everything. And then, the, the way I remember it, e Ethan got we had a uh, a friend who was a well, a, the, the a, not to not to overdo it, but we we traded scripts, we read each other's scripts, and we were both really impressed. But the funny thing is, we each had like one big note about something we didn't think worked that well in each other's screenplay. It turned out. In both cases, they were like the person's favorite thing in the script. Yeah. <laughs> so exactly. it was literally like, ah, oh, it's great. Except there's this one thing on page uh, 68 where, you know, this one character has this crazy monologue that goes on for like two and a half pages. And what were you thinking? It's like, that, that's the most important thing in the script. That's the brilliant, you know, soliloquy that's worthy of Shakespeare. So it was a bit but, of a kill your darlings moment, was it? Exactly. Moment? That's exactly, exactly, exactly what it's it was. true. But then we, we had a mutual friend who was a few years older who was already starting to make a living uh, writing sort of low-budget horror movies and moving into the studio realm is a guy by the name of uh, Mark Patrick Carducci, who is sort of, I guess, his most famous thing for genre fans is he co-wrote uh, Pumpkinhead, which is oh. a Stan Winston, uh, a really good Stan Winston movie, which ironically didn't even get a theatrical release at the time and is now, I think, a really well-regarded cult horror movie. Yeah, so, definitely uh, Hendrickson. Yeah, uh, Car yeah, Carducci right. was a friend, yeah. and uh, the way I remember, Ethan got a call from Carducci because he was like starting to write movies for New Line and stuff, and 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 Carducci had been approached by Sony, who was uh, just starting, who basically 
was starting to get into, I guess, what you would call the software business, meaning we're going to do create, we're going to do content to sell our VHS players and our cameras and everything. And it was, a, it was a low budget producer based in New York who, who had a deal, had a with, deal Sony, with Sony. Yeah, with Sony. Yeah, with right, the, and it was actually SVS, which stood for Sony Video Systems, which may have been the very first production financing entity of Sony. Yeah, of Sony. And Carducci had been approached by them to like do to to, to write like a low budget horror movie, and he's like, "Hey, you know what? I'm making too much money now." But uh, call my these young uh, buddies of mine are try, are really talented. And they're really interesting. So this producer called Ethan, and I guess there was like a time frame thing, and it was basically, oh, do you have any like we're looking for low budget horror movies, uh, but we need something to read by Friday or something. Do you have anything? And Ethan basically was like, well, I don't have anything, but uh, let me call this guy Cyrus, who I just met, who I, who I know. He, maybe he'll have something. And Ethan called me. And said, "Hey, this." Yeah, it wasn't like that because me. Ethan Ethan would never tell a producer, "I don't have anything." That's well, not really a, a good okay. move. Well, Ethan however, listened to the call and then called Cy and then go on Cy. The point is, I didn't have anything. Ethan didn't have anything, and I said, to "Ethan, well, this guy doesn't know that. Let's just come up with something over the weekend, and we'll uh, we'll turn something into him on Monday." Because uh, this is an opportunity, and we both were obviously trying to make a living writing screenplays. What, and then what actually what happened was that phone call where I had called up Cy to tell him about the opportunity and see if he had something on his shelf. That call turned into a kind of spontaneous brainstorming session to try and come up with a project for a low-budget horror movie that would fit into the paradigm that this producer had given me which was it's got to all take place in one location and it's got to be you know i have to be able to make it for a really uh, a low budget and we ended up on the phone for like an hour and we figured out to some degree the outline and and some of the details for this project that we blew totally into life over the course of that weekend because we just got together the next two days and like sat down and banged and out some crazy full-blown like outline yeah. that was like i don't know 40 pages for a what would end up being you know probably a 90 minute movie or something and that ended up being tales from the crypt presents demon night many years later right. yeah and thank god we 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 wrote we wrote demon night uh in outline form uh, Ethan turned it into the producer, and he hated it. He hated it. He was like, <laughs> I remember it was a great line. I like movies that move. This movie's <laughs> all, it doesn't move. It's all in one location. And we were like, well, that's what you told us to write. So, okay. But thankfully, because this low-budget producer passed on Demon Knight, Ethan and I were like, well, geez, we got this 40-page outline, and we think it's really good, and it's really cool. We should just write the screenplay. Um, and then we basically sat together and we wrote what uh, eventually became the Tales from the Crypt movie, Demon Knight, which is our first uh, big produced feature, studio feature. Years later, as we said. I think this was like, Ethan, I want to say we wrote this in 80s. It was seven years later because we, we wrote it in 88, 87 to 88. And the movie was actually released. It was produced in 94 and it was actually released in like January 1995. So it was about a, it was a, a seven or eight year uh, process from conception to actually going out in, into the world because that was the the origin part of the origin story right there. Yeah, that was the dawn of our collaboration of our creative collaboration. It was interesting because, and we've gotten this question many many times over the many many years of our uh, professional partnership, but. Like why why does why has our why have we been able to work together for so long? You know, why why have has our writing collaboration succeeded for so long? Because it isn't always the case with writing partnerships. And I would always give the same answer, which was writing is like a very intimate pursuit. So most people who end up as writing partners are usually intimately acquainted with each other they're either very very good friends 
or there are husbands and wives or boyfriends and girlfriends or, you know, boyfriend and boyfriend, whatever. Brothers, brothers, Be- sisters. Brothers. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Be- before they begin the work of writing together. For me and Cy, oddly enough, it was just this sort of like sequence of events that just coalesced. We barely knew each other before we actually sat down and started writing together. We had met. We had realized that we, you know, I mean, we're virtually the same age. We grew up and had the same creative influences, the same movies that we loved or directors that we loved or TV shows that we enjoyed watching. And then this opportunity sort of dropped in our laps and we decided to try and take advantage of it. It got shut down or, or cut off. And then we said, hey, we should we should write this anyway. And I remember we got together at my place and sat down side by side or I, I was standing up and I was sitting down at my like Commodore 64 computer. Oh, my and, God. And, yeah, that's how yeah, long which ago was, this was. Which was <laughs> able to hold four pages of screenplay formatted text in a file <laughs> at a time. So we had to stop and move on to a new file like every four pages. But anyhow, we sat down and we typed in, I typed in, you know, fade in. And then we wrote the opening scene for Demon Knight. And something, it was like a palpable sense in the room, I think, to both of us that something clicked. And that the way we worked together while we wrote that scene, it was just strange that we barely knew each other and hadn't been friends, hadn't been classmates, and had just got together to try and do this thing. And it really worked. And I was sitting at the keyboard but half the time I was transcribing what Sai was saying because he was standing up. And then the stuff that I was typing on the keyboard, he would then go over and, you know, adjust or revise. And obviously, if I was transcribing, I could adjust and, and revise what he was saying to me. And it was just it just worked. And then we we kept going. And, and it, it, it took a while because we had we both had, you know, our regular jobs or whatever. But we got we kept getting together on on weeknights after we were done with work or on weekends and we wrote the script. That was that was one of the things I think that was the key to our success was we didn't start out as a personal relationship. We started out as a professional writing relationship. Mm. So there was like the foundation of our relationship is the work, is the is the writing. You know, that's first and foremost. Yeah. And so it's weird. Like, so I think the problem is, and even when you see these partnerships that break up or whatever, it's all, it all has to do with personal dynamics. Like I remember I tried to work on a project with my wife once and it's one of these, it's a slippery slope where one minute you're arguing about a character or an action scene or a monologue or a scene. And the next minute you're arguing about the laundry. So it's sort of like uh, the, your personal life bleeds over too much into the work. But Ethan and I, because our relationship is based on the work, 90% of our arguments or fights or whatever are just the, the work-related things, and we work it out and, and we move forward. And so I think that's why we've been able to continue working together for so long. I think e- Ethan used to have a line where he said that um, we're both – like the the what is it Ethan the points on the circle it was the, are... the two points the two points on the circle that are simultaneously the two closest and the two furthest apart because when it comes to movies and TV and storytelling and structure we're on the same on the same mark and when it comes to life the universe and everything we were somewhat diametrically opposed but what that means is you get twice as much sort of real-world uh, verisimilitude combined into that package. Because creatively, we're on the same page. Personally, we're on opposite sides of the spectrum. But again, if you can work that, uh, it, I think it's a very, it, it becomes a very successful creative formula. Well, you work it. You certainly did. Um, I mean, we'll go get on to your uh, to a lot of your work later on. Uh, but your first projects you started working together was uh, on a Robert Davi movie called Under Surveillance, <laughs> which is writing the screenplay for yeah. uh, Jim Fisher and Jim Styles' story. So, how were you approached on this? How did that all come together? Oh my God! 
we had gotten That's an a, interesting. I mean, Robert yeah. Dobby wasn't involved when we got involved. Robert, you know, there was no cast involved. It was still just a project in development to use. We a had Hollywood met a guy. Term. We had met a guy who was a manager. Uh, our literary manager in LA on the phone. We were, I don't think and I were still in New met York. Him, si. we, our, we, yeah, we never met him. We talked to him. Met a guy who met a guy. Yeah, exactly. Our material got to this guy, and this guy read our work, and he was interested in, in trying to represent us in Hollywood. Or we were both still in New York. And he, he called us out of the blue and says, Hey, I got you guys a meeting at Chuck Freeze Entertainment. It's this straight to video. It's, it, it doesn't sound this great now, but when you, when you read it, like, it's an insurance fraud thriller. <laughs> <laughs> and we're like, okay. And, and again, listen, we have not been paid to do anything professionally outside of, you know, I had done a few things, Ethan did a few things, but really in Hollywood, nothing. And this guy said, I've got you a pitch meeting. If you can fly out here. And get to the pitch meeting. I got you a meeting on this. It's a rewrite job, but it's a it's a page one rewrite. They like the premise, but they don't like the original script. Uh, so Ethan and I literally. Yeah, well, no, we had him send us the script. He fed it back. The, back then, it was like you know, FedEx. he couldn't email it to us. He had a FedEx us uh, two copies or whatever, what copy to sign, a copy to me, and we read the script. We may have actually read the freaking script on the plane. I think I remember, I remember reading the script on the plane because the time, the timeline was so compressed, and we made our notes. And Cy and I talked about what we what we would think would be, you know, a good way to approach uh, changing or improving, you know, the screenplay. And this same guy that Cy was talking about, who became our manager, picked us up at LAX airport. And drove us to the meeting in Hollywood, and we got out, we went into the building, we went up the elevator, and they ushered us into this conference room, and we had our first ever Hollywood meeting. Where we pitched our ideas for like, oh, well, what we think of the script, how we think we can improve it, some new character ideas or new action scenes, whatever. And All right, there was one, here, sorry, let me just, there's one yeah. moment that I remember from that meeting was there was a kind of like tall, thin, sort of handsome blonde guy with very long kind of like hippie hair. And we learned later he was like the son of the founder of the company. And he was older than us at the time. We were both really young. And after we had done our whole song and dance, which seemed to go pretty well for like the half dozen people who were in the room, this guy sort of like looked at what was written on some page that he had, which I guess had like information, you know, our, our like uh, our curriculum vitae or whatever. And he looked at us and he sort of like narrowed his eyes and asked us this question. Did you guys fly out here for this? Because, <laughs> be, because, because, you know, I guess he knew we were both from New York and, or we were both living in New York and we just like showed up out of the blue or whatever. And we were like, yeah. <laughs> and he was like, okay, okay. And we left and the manager, the guy who, our future manager took us out, like not even, it wasn't even for lunch. It was like just to get like coffee or tea or a soda or a drink, a beer or whatever, like at some some place, some place, on uh, some cafe, and we sat there, and he asked us about how it went, and I re and we said we, you know, went went pretty good. We thought, and I remember somehow calling my wife back in. Maybe he gave us because we didn't have cell phones. This is before that, you know, for no. normal people, and we were just normal people. And I think I asked to borrow his cell phone, and I called my wife back in in Brooklyn, New York. And I remember this conversation because I said, you know, I don't care. If we get the job, that's awesome. If we don't get the job, I feel like we answered, we said everything we wanted to say exactly the way we wanted to say it. So it's one of the only times I've ever come out of an important conversation feeling that way. Because most of the time, there's something you forgot. There's something you, oh, I you, said you put this. the wrong way. There's something that <laughs> slipped between the cracks of your, you know, uh, overly excited mind. And I was like... It was perfect. We did it. We did it exactly the way we wanted to. If they want to hire us, great. If not, that's fine. Uh, we'll come. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll go home and we'll we'll move on. So we got the job, 
And I yeah, will and then he say, got the call that uh, they wanted to hire. Yeah, they us, wanted us to hire. So I will, I will say that, uh, and and I don't think this movie is actually available in North America in any format <laughs> known to mankind. <laughs> there is a DVD that you can track down in the UK, but I remember because it was our very first paid writing job for Hollywood, and granted, it was a low budget straight to video movie. But starring Robert Davi, who's usually the bad guy in big studio movies, but he was the lead in this. And I remember we literally, we said, okay, we're writing an insurance fraud thriller. But to us, this was like, we were, we basically wrote the Citizen Kane of insurance fraud (laughs) thrillers. I mean, we put everything into this script. We put our heart and soul and characters action scenes everything i mean we really had something to prove we were like okay who cares that it's an insurance fraud thriller we're going to write the greatest insurance fraud movie of all time now (laughs) the final movie is not that because we learned very early on a lot of this depends on the budget the director what they want to do but for us just the writing process we just totally committed to it 110 percent i remember i was disappointed when I don't want to go into a huge thing about this movie because it's a little it's 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 sort of a minor blip. But I remember the learning curve for me was, uh, you know, we got this director on board who was some like Polish immigrant slumming it in Hollywood and like making just making some money and doing crappy straight to video movies. And uh, I remember we wrote this elaborate, incredibly ambitious, choreographed, really cool action shootout scene in like a construction site with like band saws and we, I mean prop we went we went to town we did this really cool scene and I remember the director saying he says you know this scene I think I want to put it someplace more visual we're like yeah yeah that sounds cool like where he says like maybe an abandoned warehouse and <laughs> I remember or, I or going, an air or an airplane hangar those are yeah, the what, choices what? he gave us. Those yeah. are not interesting. What, what's happening? And then you realize, An oh. An empty airplane hanging. This guy's just trying to make his days, crank out some low-budget thriller. He doesn't give a shit. He doesn't care that, like, we wrote these this elaborate, amazingly cool, die-hard-level actions. He's just like, uh, that's too hard. Let's just put it in a warehouse, airplane hangar. Some guys will shoot. There'll be some crates. Something explodes move on to the yeah. next day <laughs> so it was a real eye-opener of like this is how hollywood really works you know before it got to the director though we, we had to rewrite the script like a page one rewrite from scratch right and um we always have taken our work very very seriously not in a i, I like to think not in a pretentious or affected way just in the same way like if uh, if I was a plumber or a carpenter, I would take my work seriously that the stuff I build or repair has to do its job and succeed, right? And not collapse or fall apart when you try to use it. And when we came to LA um, and worked on rewriting this movie, we we had to take the bus into Hollywood to the office every day. We slept on the floor we slept on the floor of, of manager, the manager yeah. who who had picked us up at the airport. We didn't have a car. We couldn't rent a car. We um, in, lived in New York for years. Nobody had a driver's license. If you're from it, New York, it, and also just money London, wise, we we were you know we just didn't have the money. So and he couldn't drive us to work and drop us off every day. We weren't his kids. So we would get up. We would take the bus. We had to change buses in order to get to from where his place was into Hollywood. And it was us. And the domestic staff, you know, who are all Mexicans and Guatemalan immigrants. And who's riding the bus in L.A. in like 1992. And and a couple of European backpackers from time to time. That would be the bus, which was fine. That was that was cool. But we take the bus and at night, depending on how long we had worked at the office during the day at the studio slash. uh, Yeah, it was it was a studio. Um. We'd take the bus. We'd always take the bus back. And the problem was sometimes, like, we would miss the bus because they, they, L.A. at that time, mass transit was was not a thing. And the buses would shut down at a certain time. And sometimes we'd have to, like, walk, you know, for, like, 
couple of miles to cover one step of the bus thing. So this one night, we got dropped off by the first bus in in the valley, in the San Fernando Valley, near Universal City. And we were waiting and waiting for the second bus to show up. And it was taking forever. And we didn't know if we were going to have to walk like the two miles to get back to the guys, our, our manager's uh, ha- uh, a condo. And we had left off at work at a point we disagreed about in the script. And we were, we were debating about it and discussing about it when we came and took that first bus. We got off the bus. We're waiting at this bus stop. Now, it's, it's like midnight. There's nobody on the streets. There's almost no cars. And we get into this heated, first it's a discussion, and then it's really like a heated argument about what we should do about this moment in the script. And all of a sudden, an LAPD cop car pulls up, and, and, and the cops get out, and they're like, what's going on? You know, because they're worried like that we're going to have some kind of physical altercation on Ventura Boulevard outside Universal City, whatever. But also, here's the thing. This was an L.A. learning curve, too, because in New York, everything's open till 2, 3 in the morning. There's Korean delis. There's bars. L.A., everything sort of shuts down. At least mainstream L.A. shuts down by 11, 12 o'clock at night. And here we are, like, walking the streets of Studio City arguing vehemently about some character or some fight scene or some monologue and so i'm sure now like in retrospect i'm like yeah we probably look pretty suspicious but (laughs) at the time we were like what we're just fighting about a script we're just arguing about something what's the problem officers and (laughs) i think we almost got arrested ethan for uh, yeah arguing that's not even that's not surveillance yeah, that's not even the most dramatic bus related anecdote we could tell you from that time in our in our careers, but we won't go into the other yes, ones. Yes, we no, should move because, on past yeah, past under surveillance. We we might have to. the the other one actually involved firearms being drawn by the LAPD, but not in the other But we yeah, won't exactly. talk about it. In front of the powerhouse bar on Highland. Yeah. <laughs> As a writing partnership, was there any reluctance from some uh, producers' productions of hiring two writers instead of one for budget concerns? Nobody ever was reluctant to hire us because we were a writing partnership because it would be an issue of budgetary concerns. Because when they hire a writing partnership, they don't pay you anything more than when they hire a single writer. You're a single entity and you negotiate as a single entity. So it's an interesting question. The answer is that's not really an issue. And, you know, we started out making very little money per job and we advanced up the up the ladder rung by rung, increasing our quotes and making more money per job. But you just count as a writing entity, whether you're one person or, or two people. Okay, fair enough. Uh, in 1994, oh God, the heady days of the mid 90s. Uh, yes. You work with one of Andrew's favorite directors, John Sayles, on the Dolph Lundgren action movie Men of War, also starring a show favorite in Trevor Goddard. Oh yeah, Aiden Callahan. I'm yeah. telling you. Yeah, he he really is, uh, and directed by Perry Lang. How did that come about? Uh, again, sort of a uh, I'll, I'll do a short but funny story. I was in the process of actually moving to Los Angeles from New York. Ethan got a call from our manager about this opportunity to do a a rewrite on this project. And Ethan was desperately trying to get a hold of me because I was just driving cross country. And luckily my, our, our, we got a flat tire, my wife and I near the grand Canyon. And we called, uh, my wife's father, my, uh, my father-in-law to just ask him something about the car and he said, oh, size writing partner is trying to get in touch with them. And you guys have a big meeting in Hollywood, like on Monday, and you have to get there. I was like, what, what? Uh, so it was a similar situation uh, to under surveillance. You know, I, I we met uh, uh, met with the producers, met with Perry Lang, who was the director. Uh, so there were two issues, and the script was great, but there were two issues with it. It was going to be a vehicle for Dolph Lundgren. Now, the John Sayles script, the character that Dolph played, had a lot of 
very brilliantly written heady monologues and interesting insights into imperialism and geopolitical issues and all this great stuff. And they said, well, Dolph can't say any of this stuff. So so what you have to do is create an entire ensemble cast of characters who can basically give voice to all these themes because Dolph just can't play this stuff. So that was mission number one. All right. So, okay, make Dolph more of a sort of uh, a speaks quietly, has a big stick, man of few words, action hero, which is what Dolph has done through his entire career, what he's really good at. And so we had to create all these other supporting characters. I think the, the John Seale script was more of a one-man army movie. So we created a group of mercenaries to support Dolph's character. And we gave them a lot of the uh, the dialogue and, and some of these monologues. And we things just, we that, spread the, we spread the, spread, the, spread the wealth around, mm. spread the material around. And then the other thing was, this was more of a, sort of an arty film and we're making a Dolph Lundgren action movie so you guys got to put a ton more action into it so those were the two two paradigms like create a supporting cast of mercenaries for Dolph which was actually fun for us because we got to create a bunch of characters for this movie and then add a shit ton more action and so those were our sort of uh our mandates and the joke is Perry Lang, who I think went on to direct television, who was a former actor, did a really, I think, a really terrific job directing that movie. And uh, it did not get a theatrical in the U.S., but it got picked up by Miramax and I think got a theatrical through Europe and overseas because we run into a lot of uh, people uh, from Europe who are like huge fans of this movie. And years later, I was at the gym and I ran into Dolph Lundgren and I said, hey, Dolph, you don't remember. You're not going to remember me, but my partner and I, Ethan, we worked on Men of War. And he's like, oh, that's one of my best movies. You guys did a great job. So, uh, you know, I, even Dolph will say that that's one of his best movies. And ironically, we got to share a screen credit with John Sayles, who's also one of my favorite writer directors. Mm -hmm. yeah. so. Well, John Sayles, I mean, he originally wrote the script and. Apparently, from what I hear, he only had action within the third act towards the end. Yes, there was the, there was an action finale, yes. So we had to add action all through it. And again, Dolph's, it was yeah, very think, much like... I think John Sayles wrote it as a work for hire. I don't believe it was just, you know, he, he set out to... He wasn't going to direct I, I it, I don't think. I don't think it was a spec script or something he was going to make himself. It was just a project that, you know, when he was still a working screenwriter, or at least that was part of of his portfolio still you know that was a, a gig he had um and yeah he did a, he did a good job but it was very but intimidating it, for it was very intimidating for me to be like oh my god we're rewriting john sales but again yeah. i think our job was very specific so we weren't in a situation where we were going to up a great john sales script we were just taking a john sales script and adapting it to different needs of the finished movie um, more action and again. also 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 updating it because it had been written I, I think it had been written in the early 80s and like before platoon even had come out right it was it sort was of written, a vietnam it was parable. obviously written yeah it was written as a vietnam allegory type of a type of a movie story and that was interesting and cool but the world had sort of passed that version of the story by i think from no fault of John Sayles. It's just the, the the world kept turning and movies kept coming out, and we just connected it to the night, the world of the the early to mid '90s. You know, yeah. in, in both a, a storytelling way and also in the geopolitical way, because it was a little bit different. You know, it was already a little bit different world than it had been. Well, it's funny that you brought up uh, Miramax uh, because the legend goes that they bought the movie out from Sony's interest with the intention of a theatrical release, like you say, um, but then apparently just dumped it on straight to video after it sitting on the shelf for a year. So do you remember the circumstances behind all this? How did you find out about it all? N not really. I mean, I think it was just, uh, you know what? The joke was, I think Dolph, Dolph's theatrical window had closed by the time that movie was finished. He had a certain theatrical career, and then he was sort of became more of a king of uh, the video store. I think it was basically just practically. 
But the movie looked so good. Uh, it was really well shot. The locations were great. Again, Perry did a great job directing it. That I think at some point, I think that's why it got released theatrically overseas. Because like, well, it's a, it's a really good looking movie. Mm. So yeah. it's sort of the video TV didn't really give it its due at that point. So I think it played well theatrically, which is why it got a overseas theatrical release. The the thing I'll mention about that is that we were we were definitely not in the loop. We were not on the call list of the important players to be alerted of changes to the no. <laughs> planned release because we were the writers. <laughs> and in Los Angeles, in Hollywood, in general, the writers are super valuable and super important while people are waiting to get the script. And then if they're super happy with the script, maybe, you know, the writers can come to the set or even hang out on the set or for, for a bit. And then the writers are gone. Or if people aren't super happy with the script, then the writers are replaced by other writers or people's cousins or, you know, girlfriends or whoever who's the next writers. And then the writers are gone. So it's an interesting, it's an interesting like flip, right? From, oh, how are things? How are you guys doing? What can we do for you? How's it going? Wow, this is, this is so important. Wow, this is so vital. Wow, thank you so much. Or, wow, this sucks. You have to change it. And then it's just like, Crickets, and then we don't need you anymore. We have the script. You know, yeah, they moved on. Yeah, is he? You know, um, yeah, that's the what's the great thing. I think one of the reasons we started doing so much work in television is it's like the opposite. In television, you get as a writer, you get to actually produce your own work for the most part. Whereas in film, you're just sort of the low man on the totem pole. You get paid a lot of money. You come in, you do the work, and then they basically just take over because movies are still somewhat driven by. Uh, directors and and stars and uh, whereas television is still pretty much driven by story Mm -hmm. so the writers get a little bit more power actually a lot more power in television things are changing now with streaming but it, it really the reason writers became producers and had power in television was because the most important thing when, when television especially used to have a deadline when in like uh, you know and this is the same in the for US network UK. for broadcast network right TV. when it's like hey I got to put something on the air at eight o'clock on Friday well guess what what's the most important thing the script because I got to have something to film so I can put something on TV on Friday night the script was always more important than the star more important by the director it's like mm-hmm. hey we got to put something on TV Friday we need something to film. I don't care what it is. I don't care who's in it. I need something to film. Which is why in the traditional Hollywood television show hierarchy, the captain of the creative ship, the showrunner, was the writer, the head writer. Yeah, because that was the most writer, important creator. thing. Whereas, as opposed, to, the old days, as opposed to with feature films where, you know, the captain of the creative ship is the director and sometimes a producer director or, or a star, or sometimes a writer director or whatever. But yeah, or, or a producer star. Yeah. If Tom Cruise or Brad Pitt or uh, Leonardo DiCaprio want to make a movie next month, they got a pile of scripts, right? They'll find something to do. <laughs> yeah. It's like DiCaprio is like, well, I'm, I want to make it. So the script is the script is like uh I don't want to downplay it, but I'm saying in the in the hierarchy of that decision making process, it's not the most important thing. DiCaprio's time is the most important thing. Brad Pitt's like, oh, Brad Pitt is a window, three month window. He wants to make something. Okay, well, what is what, here? We got a pile of things. What is Brad like? In television, it's still it's very different. Also, television is still no matter how big your home screen is, it's still not as big as in a movie theater. So, again, the stories are still what draw you into television. People talk about a show like Game of Thrones that's a massive, huge budgeted show. Nobody watched Game of Thrones for the dragons. They watched Game of Thrones because they got into the characters and they got into the story, into the plot and everything. So it was even the biggest budget TV project, I think, is still very driven by the writing. Well, speaking of TV... Uh, funny enough, Seeks us into uh, the next year where 
you'd obviously developed this project of Demon Knight that had been circling Hollywood for a number of years. Now, prior to it becoming uh, a Tales from the Crypt movie, had you gotten kind of a serious interest as a movie before that? We had from the straight from the get go, from the moment that we finished writing the spec script, which was totally original of Demon Knight with a K, it was always under option. There was always interest. There were always at, in the beginning because we were nobodies with no track record, no credits. It was a free option, but it was still an option. And it was constantly trying to be made by different producers and different production companies with different directors being attached over the course of those intervening seven years between when we first wrote it and when it finally got made as the first modern Tales from the Crypt it, movie. It got close to getting made twice. At first time, it almost got made by Tom Holland, who had done Fright Night and Child's Play. And this was going to be a follow-up to Child's Play. Um, and we had done some rewrites for Tom Holland. And then that fell apart. And then uh, a few years later, it almost got made by Mary Lambert, who had just done Pet Cemetery. And then it wound its way to the Tales from the Crypt people. Tales from the Crypt was a successful television show. And they were trying to branch it out into a... Uh, series of feature films and Universal was the studio and what happened is they had two scripts already that had been developed by the Tales from Crypt TV people and they had a third slot and they were actually trying to negotiate to get uh, Quentin Tarantino's Dusk Till Dawn when it was still a screenplay as the third of the Tales from the Crypt movies and then Tarantino blew up uh, I think Pulp Fiction opened and Suddenly, he wanted too much money, and they couldn't close that deal. And somehow, Demonite had been sort of lying around the offices at Silver Pictures. Uh, the Tales Script television show was sort of a joint, uh, had a bunch of big Hollywood producers on it. It was Joel Silver, Bob Zemeckis, Walter Hill, Richard Donner. And somebody suggested, as well, there's a script Demonite that's been circulating. And what we heard was that it was the – it's not that anybody loved Demon Knight at Tales from the Crypt. It was that it was the only script that all these big producers could agree on. Like <laughs> everything else they had submitted, like, you know, oh, Donner loves it, but Joel Silver hates it. Uh, Walter Hill loves it, but Bob Zemeckis hates it. So Demon Knight was sort of like the compromise, and it was the third of three features. So it's like, eh. By the time we get to this movie, uh, maybe we can come up with something better if we, if, we want, if we find something better. They sent all three scripts to Universal, and suddenly Ethan and I get a call like the week later and say, oh, guess what? We sent all these scripts to Universal, and the one they really want to make first, the one they really like, is Demon Knight. Yeah, we, we, went, from, we went from last to first in a, in a matter of uh, days, which was a tremendously – awesome surprise you know for us obviously yeah but it was yeah well mentioning there joel silver and he's a favorite on the show when we had richard mirishan who worked with joel silver we've had many people who shared you know stories about the man now obviously knowing the reputation that he had in hollywood and obviously he's been parodied in movies as well uh were you kind of both nervous about meeting the man over demon knight no, no. In fact, Ethan has the the great Demonite Joel Silver story. Ethan, you should tell it. Tell the well. Yeah, I don't think we weren't we weren't nervous about it. We were just excited. I think we were too excited not about meeting him, just about our project actually moving forward with a major studio producing it. And what had happened, the story size si referring to is the title Demonite had been changed by. The, the development people at Silver who had first gotten it from us and tried to find somebody to make it with them in the early days before Tales from the Crypt became uh, part of the story. And they well, what the word was de demons. Yeah, demons don't sell. You can't put demon in a title movie. De Nobody likes demons. Demons don't sell. Demon is because box if you remember poison. the 90s, the, the mid 90s was a, a sort of like a lull in feature horror filmmaking. Mm. The only yeah, horror yeah. films that were being made were being made by low budget, largely straight to video companies. 
and it had sort of disappeared off the studio radar. So no, they didn't want, they, they, they felt like, oh, this is a really good script. It's a really good story. We have a chance to find a way to make this. But by putting Demon in, on the cover page, you're cutting your odds by like 50%. So we got to replace it. Oh, the title had been changed to Judgment Night. And then about a year after that, <laughs> there was a... Emilio's a, a, movie. Yeah, yes, Emilio yes. Yes. movie came out called Judgment Night. Called Judgment Night. So it's like, well, we can't use that title anymore. We were at the Silver Pictures uh, offices at Warner Brothers Studios. Joel Silver came in and he was sort of like marching through the hallway into his office and... He said, like, you know, that we should, we should like, come in because he, he had something to talk to us about or whatever. And we honestly, I think that was the first time that we were going to have a – I mean, we'd met him before, but more in passing at the offices for, like, oh, congratulations, that's great, and, you know, blow past us, whatever, um, when the movie got greenlit. But this was the first time we ever had an actual meeting with him. And we didn't exactly, we had no idea what it was going to be about. And he waited for us to like follow him into his office. And we went into his office and he, he explained, uh, we have this problem because, you know, this other, this other, I re-, and he said, I, I, I got ahead of it. I registered judgment night with like the MPAA, ha ha ha. So they can't get it from us, but I had to give it to him because they called me and they asked because, you know, companies can register titles in advance and they like and sort of get dibs on them pay titles yeah it's like okay you can have judgment night but you got to give me this title it's some weird thing like <laughs> yeah, that whatever <laughs> so so he he had registered judgment night but then some some other big shot hollywood mogul had called him up representing the studio or the production for the emilio estevez movie which was end up being called judgment night and had convinced him to let them use it because it was it was just too important to them, or maybe he promised something in return, or maybe he had something he could blackmail Joe Silver about. I don't know. Who knows? So so, jo- so Joel Silver goes. Says- Silver goes. I we, we got to change the title. We can't use Judgment Night. What what are we going to do? What are we going to use as the title? And-, and then Ethan Ethan totally fearlessly steps up to Joel and says, "Well, you know, Joel, we could use the original title." <laughs> <laughs> which which we always loved, and which is Demon Knight with a K. And he sort of there was sort of like this pregnant pause, and neither Cy nor I had any idea what the result would be. And after a, a couple of seconds, Joel sort of shrugged and then gave like a small smile, hint of a smile, said, Demon Knight, Demon Knight with a K, yeah. That's cool. We'll do that. <laughs> and we were like, so we got our we title back. We, we, we were just like, yes, you know, it was it, it was a very brief but successful sort of royal or imperial audience kind of a thing <laughs> with the great Joel Silver. <laughs> well, Demon Knight was uh, a pretty decent hit in the U.S., uh, but sadly, it didn't get a theatrical release in the U.K. Uh, now, how do you two both feel in regards to the finished movie? versus your original scripts were you both happy with it artistically do you have some issues how do you feel well i think for the most part i think a demonite turned out really well and ironically it's like it's the movie we get asked about a lot now it's sort of become for a lot of reasons i think parts of what ethan said there's a sort of dearth of good horror movies in the early 90s um so it's it's become a real cult favorite i i think it's really good we still have a few you know we still have a few bugaboos or things that uh that i think were not every writer every writer who writes the original screenplay has complaints about the final movie but uh for the most part i think it turned out really good yeah it has a great cast it it had a, a we felt and i think the audience agreed and has continued to agree over the years a really cool sort of like practical effects mm. human body contortion you know uh visual the demons, the creatures, visual yeah, portrayal really cool. of the demons which is really I, we think at least is is really cool there are like Sai alluded to there are there are certain issues that we had at the time we actually got fired off the movie by the guys who were the hands-on creative producers uh there are issues that that we had 
some of those were actually resolved because when they first finished their version and did a test audience release, the movie did well until the ending, which they had changed against our uh, uh, strongly expressed wishes. And the sort of air went out. You could feel in the audience with the test screening the air go out of the balloon in the sort of third act finale of the movie. And they actually went back and reshot the ending. Now, the reshot ending that's in the movie is not exactly what we had originally written because, unfortunately, they had struck the sets. So they couldn't, it would have cost them too much to rebuild everything from scratch and shoot it exactly the way it, it, it had been before the final changes they made. But they did some version of, of rebuilding stuff and they went back and the ending is still largely, it, 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 it contains the essence, the sort of creative essence of what we had written. So Original it was ending, much, yeah. much better than the interim ending, which, which they had replaced uh, our ending with. So, yeah, it, we both really like the movie. We both are very happy that it's lived on. You know, like Sai said, of all the stuff we've worked on, there are more devoted fans of Demonite um, than, than anything else, probably. Well, as we said here, uh, Tales from the Crypt, it was originally planned as a trilogy of crypt movies. Uh, were you guys ever approached to contribute to the uh, other movies following the success of Demon Knight, or was that just it? Oh, no. No, because we they killed... They remember, we rewrote the... Again, the second Bordello Blood, I don't think it's any mystery, or, or I'm not saying anything shocking, was a, a terrible movie and basically bombed and killed the franchise, so there really weren't any more Tales from the Crypt movie. Even if Bordello of Blood had been a box office triumph, Cy and myself would never have been approached to contribute anything more to the Tales from the Crypt movies. We got fired off of Demon Knight, and we were the outsiders. We were the guys who had written a spec action horror movie that got picked up into and plugged into the Tales from the Crypt machinery. But the guys who were the hands-on captains of that ship who were a writing producing team that had run the TV show on HBO for several years, they were very unhappy with our script being made first as opposed to the scripts that they had written and planned to direct and they were not happy with our presence being around and they also did bordello blood so um uh -huh. no. so, we, we had so no further the, involvement we, we got to yes. visit the set one day <laughs> for demon night <laughs> that was the extent of our involvement we wait we, we got to go to the audience test screening where their remade reimagined ending failed Bomb. catastrophically yeah. which was a lot of fun even though it was painful <laughs> it was like watching your own child fail miserably when your ex-wife was in charge of their education and then, <laughs> what a great and then, horrifying but great analogy yeah. that... i don't have any ex-wives that's a theoretical construct in there my you mind. go no no ethan i was going to say we had demon knight sequels planned but uh, I, I, That's true. we always, we always talk about head. Here's the catch 22 yeah. for whatever two decades. We've been asked, when's the sequel coming out? And it's always sad when we have to tell him, unfortunately, you know, never because the rights issues are too complex and multi-layered with and tales from the crypt. It's not, it's not just our original project. It's the tales from the crypt and the tales from the crypt productions and universal studios. And the, the, the catch 22 irony is if Demon Knight had not been picked up by Tales from the Crypt and Universal, it probably would have been a straight-to-video movie, and there probably would have been, like, ten sequels by now uh, of these low-budget straight-to-video movies. Because it got picked up from Tales of the Crypt, it was a big studio movie. It had a great cast. It had uh, a, a decent budget. I think it was 12 to $15 million at the time. And it was a big theatrical release. But... Because of it being part of Tales from the Crypt now, it's there. There's never going to be a sequel. The rights issues are so convoluted and so crazy. I know uh, M Night Shyamalan was going to try to do a. It was they were all set to do a new Tales from the Crypt series uh, recently, and even that got torpedoed because of the rights issues. So it's just you know, Demon Knight 
exists as this great thing, but it's again, it's it's now because of it being part of Tales from the Crypt, sort of a double edged sword. So there you go. And that's where we're going to have to leave the interview for this particular moment. But do not fret, fair listener, because there is not just one more week coming, but it's also going to be two more. So stay tuned for more from Cyrus and Ethan. But for now, it's time to nominate five. Now's the time to nominate five. Nominate five! Yes, nominate five! But three... Yes, nominate five is back. Yes, isn't it just <laughs> uh, right? And uh, well, our nominate five for Cyrus and Ethan is going to be in a couple of weeks at the end yes. of the episode. So I'm dreading to think what the hell you're going to do because. <laughs> I have a feeling it's my turn to face the guillotine. Right? It is. You are up in front of the firing squad this time around. He rubs his hands in anticipation. Okay, so we open the show with a lot of positivity surrounding once. Um, I'm not happy with that. I want to hear some negativity. So, oh, no. Yes. No. Andy, I want you to nominate your five most disliked movies oh. and why oh god it may seem obvious but come on we we usually go oh this is the one movie that inspired me this is the one film which you know made me want to become an actor or director no i want to know what makes you go ugh <laughs> the, the five films that made me hate the business yeah okay um all right, I guess I can do that. And I've got to send out apologies to anyone who's listening who may have worked on these movies. Um, but for me, they were just uh, they were just too much. Yeah. Okay. I mean, just look at Josh Brolin, Jonah Hex, and then Josh Brolin, uh, Infinity War. <laughs> oh, you know, shit. Yeah. really good actor, but sometimes you've got to work with what you got, and sometimes what you've got ain't good. Well... I'll, I'll just throw them out there because this has really been lumped on me. So, okay. So, I guess what? Number five? Number five. Okay. Um, we've not shown this movie a lot of love in the past. We have mentioned this before. Uh, it's going to be funny because most of these are installments of franchises. And usually franchises are a sore point for me because I'll, I'll like the original and I'll always question whether they needed a sequel. Uh, this was something that never needed to happen, and I don't think a lot of people would disagree. For number five, I am going to choose A Good Day to Die Hard. Oh, yes. All right. And this, yes. Is, this is no disrespect to uh, the Irish director, John Moore, because John Moore gave us Max Payne, which people are on the shelf about, but I really liked. Uh, he mm-hmm. did a pretty decent remake of Flight of the Phoenix. Uh, he did an, an okay remake of The Omen that didn't really need to be remade apart from a marketing thing. And the movie Behind Enemy Lines that he did with Gene Hackman and Owen Wilson was pretty good as well. You know, and he is really talented. He's got this great look for his movies. But I cannot understand why the hell no. A Good Day to Die Hard was made. And I think this was the point where it was the nail in the coffin for John McClane's character. Yeah, this is the one where you can just see Bruce Willis just... He he just does not care throughout the whole thing. And I know he's, he's going through a rough patch at the moment. I, I don't know if this might have been kind of like the beginnings of that because after this, it was kind of around about that time that he started to shift over to more to those direct to, uh, DVD affairs. But he just does not give a damn. Yeah, well, he was doing those direct to... DVD movies prior to coming back for A Good Day to Die Hard. And I saw this on a plane, which is not a good way to watch a movie in any way, shape or form. It's it's just so weak. It was so weak. And it was, I guess you could say, uninspiring. Yeah. It, right. It's short. The plot doesn't make much sense. The, the motivations behind the characters don't make much sense. The twist reveal doesn't make any sense. Nothing makes any sense. 
And it's an hour and a half long. Yeah, it is the shortest of the Die Hard movies by a long way. But I have a theory that this actually was not made as a Die Hard movie. Well, actually, as far as I'm aware, this is the first Die Hard movie that was actually written as a Die Hard movie. Really? Yeah, because you had the first one was uh, based on a book by Roderick Thorpe. Yes, Um, Uh, Glass Tower or something like that. Uh, something like that. Um, the second one was a book called, I think it was called 59 Minutes or 56 Minutes, um, which had nothing to do with John McClane whatsoever, but they adapted that one. The third one was originally a script by, uh, was it Simon Hensley? I believe so, yes. Yeah, um, called Simon Says, which again had nothing to do with John McClane, but they appropriated it and then that came on board. The mm-hmm. fourth one was based on an article uh, an article about cyber terrorism, cyber terrorism and yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. securities. And this was the very first one that they actually sat down and went, okay, let's write a John McClane movie. And, and the results kind of speak for themselves, I guess. Mm. Um, it's just... I mean, there are some inspiring action scenes. The the chase throughout Russia, the car chase, I thought, you know, oh, this is pretty cool. But other than that, it's, the plot makes very little sense. You don't care at the end of the day. Um, no. It feels like it was a deliberate attempt to pass over the Die Hard franchise and, and push Bruce out the door. Yeah, but they picked Jai Courtney to do it. The, well, the charisma vacuum that is Jai Courtney. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you wouldn't believe this guy is also what is it, Captain Boomerang? He's brilliant as Captain Boomerang. He yeah, really great. is. In this movie, it was a whole load of why. Hmm. It was just really frustrating. I was watching it on the plane, and I was like, "This is actually really bad." It killed off my interest. I mean, the Die Hard movies were kind of dipping and dipping. You know, I've got a bit of love for Die Hard too. Love the first Die Hard like everyone does. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not much of a fan of Die Hard with a Vengeance. <gasps> I love uh, that one. No, no, I'm, 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 it just didn't kind of work for me. And um, Live Free or Die Hard injected a bit of life into it. I thought, okay, this is kind of clever, and it's got all of the 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 tick points. So uh, I actually think that's probably the second best Die Hard movie. Uh, controversial as it is um, but A Good Day to Die Hard is like this it's like that one cousin you don't want to invite into a box set yeah yeah I remember seeing the, the when it came out and it was out on uh, DVD and everything and it went into HMV and they were showing the, the box set but it was just the four movies not the five it was just the four yeah I think everyone kind of forgets that movie has been made now and probably should. You know, it is um, a pretty bad movie that I wanted to give up, and I actually did get through it, but I was kind of wondering why I did. Mm. Um, so, yeah, uh, Good Day to Die Hard. I'm going to put it at number five. All right, then. What is your number four? Oh, I actually want to place this higher, but no, I'm, I'm going to be fair because it's kind of tough. I am going to place... Uh, a movie that got me so angry. I mean, realistically, spitting venom. I went to see this with our old friend Will. Hi, Will. We used, hi, Will, that we used to go and see movies with. Um, and I went to see Pacific Rim Uprising. Oh. I was so offended by this movie. In It, it was soulless. It was dull. It was stupid. You know how I hate what I term as video games on screen. Yeah. Where there's no thought in it. It's just delivering another big sequence with like no real energy or emotion or driving force behind it. And Pacific Rim Uprising is the perfect example of that. Um the scene that really pushed me over the edge, they've just had this huge battle scene, hundreds of people are dead in this city from all of these robots and kaiju fights, whatever. And John Boyega, who I don't think is as good as he probably thinks he is. I, I don't know. I, th- I think he's been handed some really shitty material. I don't think he's actually been given the chance to properly shine. I think he's got a lot in him that could uh, properly 
burst out of there, but he's doing crap like this. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I was I was interested because I mean it has the the kind of deep rising <laughs> the deep rising wish list mm-hmm. of uh, ethnic characters, and any movie that has Rinko Kikuchi in it is all right in my book usually. But um, you have poor Scott Eastwood, whose legacy from his famous father is widening movie by movie. And it's like, Scott, why? Not, I don't even think Clint did a big blockbuster of this. And I know you're trying to differentiate yourself from your dad's legacy and stuff, but my God, there wasn't a better movie than Pacific Rim Uprising. But there's a scene at the end where... Um, John Boyega and the girl, I think it was um, Kaylee Spaney, I think her name was. So they defeat the main big monster. It's leveled this city, killed millions and millions, thousands of people. And they fall out of their robot into all of this snow. And they look around at all the carnage and then start having a joyful play snowball fight with each other. And I'm like, Wow. You know, I know this is supposed to be a, a big movie, but that's just that's so just deaf. shit. You know, yeah. absolute shit. And I felt guilty when I had to walk into the legendary pictures. <laughs> I had to walk into legendary entertainment, and they had all the props from Pacific Rim because that was their movie out at the moment. And I'm like, oh fuck, I went to see this last week, and it's awful. And if it wasn't for the fact that the person I was meeting there said, "Yeah, this film wasn't very good." I was like, oh, thank God for that. <laughs> yeah. And you work here. You know? <laughs> so it was directed by um, a guy called Stephen S. D. Knight. And he's a producer and writer. And, you know, he, he was responsible for directing Pacific Rim. But he was also a producer on the Daredevil series. He was a producer on Jupiter's Legacy, which some people say got cancelled way too early. I think he's produced probably more hits then, direct, I mean, he's only directed uh, six things. You know, he was a director on Smallville. He was a director on the, the Devil. Well, he directed one episode of the Daredevil TV series and he directed a couple of episodes of Jupiter's Legacy. But this was his only foray into a movie. And I think it's kind of killed that now, <laughs> I'd, I'd hate to say. Um, you know, he's talented. He does a lot of huge, big blockbuster stuff. But, you know, this movie was. So offensive, and I was trapped because I had to kill the time until Ready Player One started. So I was like, oh, we've got enough time to go and watch this movie first. But yeah, uh, Pacific Rim Uprising should be placed higher, but on this occasion, there were other movies that were worse. Oh, I can't wait to see what they are. Um, All right, then, so what is number three? Numero tres. Okay, I, I crib about this movie quite a lot, and uh, it became a really good running joke between me and Bill Daly, but I am actually going to say Jonah Hex is my number three. <laughs> yeah, I brought it up at the beginning and didn't even realise. Okay, wax lyrical yes. about this cinematic car crash. Go on. Okay, if ever a movie has been a, a, a what the f*** in terms of everything... I don't understand how a movie with such an amazing cast, and there was a great cast involved with it, can result in a movie that gets cut down to 80 minutes. This felt like a film that they'd already given up on. I mean, look, you had Josh Brolin, you had Megan Fox, you had Malkovich, you had Fassbender, mm-hmm. uh, Will Arnett was in there, um, Michael Shannon was in there, and it was directed by... Um, I guess a guy who really worked in the animation department and was an actor as well by the name of Jimmy Haywood. And uh, that's a name that obviously not a lot of people have heard of since. Uh, He was the director of Horton Hears a Who. Mm -hmm. So obviously it was prime for doing Jonah Hex, this badass Western character. And the only thing that he directed kind of afterwards feature-wise was another animated movie called Free Birds uh, that Scott Mosher produced. Oh yes, I well I I remember the name, but I'll be damned if I can remember what that film looked like. I can just remember the poster said something like "Hang on to your nuggets," mm. which is probably the the only thing that I can actually say about that. But um, it was just a very bizarre movie, 
in that I actually wanted it to be better. You know, and when you get movies like The Green Lantern, which we have covered, it's in the archives, you can find mm -hmm. that episode, you know, and but Jonah Hex is one of those movies that should have had a lot more going for it. Um, and it's a real shame. Uh, there's got to be a reason why this film was so short. And I think that might be the problem. I actually wanted to see more of it. Uh, and although Megan Fox basically says it's the worst movie she's ever done, which I, I, I won't even get into that one. It does make you wonder, because if so much was cut out that it had to end up hitting cinemas with an 80-minute runtime, how much important storytelling was left on the cutting room floor, and could that be reinserted to make a better version of the film? Or was it just garbage from shoot day to shoot day? Yeah, I mean, it had a disastrous box office performance. It wasn't even really advertised very well. We never got it in the cinemas here in the UK either. Do we not? No, it came straight to DVD here. Oh. So because of the disastrous box office in the US, they cut the number of countries back um, that it was going to be released in. The, the stupid thing is they released this movie on the same day as Toy Story 3, mm. which it had no chance. Right? It, I'm sorry, nothing, nothing could have done that and uh, gotten away with it. And as I remember, Bill was telling me this was originally supposed to be directed by Neville Dean and Taylor, who did the Crank movies. Because uh, they were supposed to be directing, they'd adapted the screenplay as well. And they kind of stepped down due to creative differences with the people at Warner Brothers. And the worst thing is, I mean, for the short amount of time this movie has been made, well, the running time of this movie, you know, they did reshoots late in production. So there's a weird story that needs to be kind of told about this movie. And it's something I really want to drag Bill into and talk about. Because this could have been great. And it feels like three quarters of a movie. And then they suddenly wrap it up really quick. And I think... The reason why I choose this as a number three is because I was so disappointed in the final product because I wanted it to be so much better. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas all these other films, I, I didn't really have any love for them at all going into them, I guess. Okay, no, I can definitely get where you're coming from. Because it's if you've got your heart set on something or you hear something which has got a wonderful or interesting premise, then you want it to succeed because that then means that they could then have more of it or it could be expanded on or whatever. So, no, I totally get that. Um, right, so that was number three. We're down to number two. Number two. Okay. Still pretty fresh in my mind. And I'll tell you this. I actually turned it off just over halfway through. Okay. And this would be Matrix Resurrections. Mm. This mm. movie was awful. Absolutely god-awful. Yeah. I have not met a person who has defended this yet. <laughs> I, I, I will do... I will defend some elements of it. it. I will not defend the actual finished product, but there are certain things in it that I liked. Really? Really. Explain. Yeah, okay, okay. Um, there are certain things that they touch on early on um, that could have been great. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, maybe the the idea of uh, uh, Anderson, Neo, back in the Matrix, and he's then creating, like, his own Matrix within the Matrix. That could have been something that could have been wonderful to expand on and look into, you know, this kind of um, Russian doll of uh, Matrix with the Matrix with the Matrix. That could be something that could have been looked at. Um, there's some nice little touches on the way that the world has kind of changed. Um, and the I thought like the last 15, 20 minutes, that whole action scene was a nice little touch, the way that the, the inhabitants of the Matrix are basically being turned into these suicidal, um, almost like zombie hordes. I thought, okay, no, I like that. So there are certain things in here that I like, but it's like trying to enjoy a paint-by-numbers painting that's been done by a toddler. Uh, that's a good way of putting it. No, the, the movie is just plain bad. And I feel 
bad for Lana Wachowski mm. uh, because the days of Bound and the original Matrix, and I, I guess the Matrix Reloaded, which I did like, are long gone. Mm. And instead we get movies like Jupiter Ascending, which was a bad movie. But, you know, at times they can do groundbreaking movies. I love Cloud Atlas. You know, I, I do think that they have a very visual eye, the Wachowskis. Mm-hmm. But this movie, it killed the cash cow and it feels like it was deliberate. Yeah, I think I, I said that to you recently. It, it feels like because Warner Brothers were going to go ahead and make the movie regardless of if the Wachowskis were involved or not, that Lana took that as an affront and just basically went, you know what? Fuck you. You're not doing anything with our little baby unless we say you are. So I'm going to go out of my way and sabotage this to make sure that you don't make anything else in the future. Yeah. Uh, and to be honest, uh, the movie, I never finished it. I turned it off um, at the 90 minute mark. I was like, I can't do this. I, I just can't get through mm. it anymore. I am bored, rigid. I'm disappointed. And this is just absolutely shocking. So. I didn't want to go for that extra hour. It's an extra hour of my life I knew I was never yeah. going to get back. And it takes a lot for me to actually either walk out of a movie or turn one off. But I'm doing it more and more nowadays, so I think I'm turning into a real grouchy <laughs> bastard when it comes to movies that are coming out now. Uh, I almost turned the new Scream movie off for kind of the same reasons. It was like, you know what? You're just making me feel foolish for actually liking the originals. Yeah, And... Uh, Wes Craven, I feel, would not have been on board with what happened to Scream now. I mean, it had some things, but it just felt weak. And this was weak. It was a weak movie, and um, yeah, that's my number two. Yeah, there was there was a lot in it that that, that was just like so heavy handed. It lacked any of the elegance and subtlety that the the Matrix films had. It we did so much of the meta commentary, particularly at the beginning, was almost cringeworthy and and just just appalling to sit through. But yeah, I actually, I went to the cinema with a few friends on opening day, and I don't think anyone, any one of us, can actually just go. Yeah, I like that movie. Yeah, yeah. So okay, that's number two, which was a solid number two. So, what do we have for number one? Well, take a wild stab in the dark on this one, which is exactly what I wanted to do to anybody who said this film was worthy of the money that I spent going to see it. I have a rough guess, but why don't you tell the ladies and gentlemen what it is? Oh, even better. I could play an entire episode that we have recorded many years (laughs) ago when seeing this movie, exactly what I think of this movie. Rambo Last Blood. All right, listen, Mm. I'm going to say here, when you're going to see a Rambo film, you're not going to see high arts. You are not going to see Shakespeare, even though I do think First Blood is a great tragedy movie in a sense that, you know, it's real strong piece of cinema. Yeah. And the story is great. It's just everything after that has been a bit, yeah. But no more than Rambo Last Blood. And I've got to kind of really censor myself here because I rambled about this for well over an hour (laughs) the day after I saw it on our original tester episode. Yeah, in the echoey office. In the echoey office. And we, you know, we we actually released that for you because I seeked it into a great way to trigger Steve with the movie word uh, that set him off for another half hour. But um, I was so disappointed uh, and I wasn't even going in expecting it to be any good whatsoever. I just thought, oh, I'm going to go see this. Oh, it's not screened for critics. That bodes well. <laughs> you know, um, It's always a winner, isn't it? Directed by Adrian Grunberg, and he did a movie with Mel Gibson called Get the Gringo, also known as How I Spent My Vacation or something like that. It was actually pretty good. Uh, and he was, you know, he's, he's done a lot of assistant directing on big movies, like uh, he was Jack Reacher and uh, Apocalypto, uh, Jarhead, Man on Fire, Master and Commander, funnily enough, he was uh, first assistant director on that movie, mm-hmm. which you enjoyed. Yeah, I did. And, you know, he, he had a really extensive career, but I'm telling you, this movie was not shot as a Rambo movie because there's only one mention of him being Rambo in the entire thing, and that's 
in a really dodgy shot where someone actually looks at his driver's license. It was at the time, I think I labeled it as like Donald Trump's wet dream. It really was. It was such a right wing America first. Everyone out there, particularly in Mexico, are rapists and murderers. It was just this, it was a horrible, horrible critique on anyone that didn't happen to be white. And I, I, I walked out of that cinema with you and I was like Crichton in Red Dwarf. I'm almost annoyed. <laughs> you were. You were. It was back when we both were smoking. Uh, we both, well, I've quit. I don't know about you. Um, but we stood outside the cinema where I, I gave you a cigarette and you you looked like you needed one to calm your nerves. You looked like you were, your head was just going to pop off your shoulders. That was the movie that resulted in me cancelling my cinema membership. Mm-hmm where I could go and watch as many movies as I wanted. And it's a shame because I was going to go and watch Ad Astra, but it made it pissed me off that much that I was like, I don't want to go to the cinema ever again. It was like I just felt like every bit of taste that could possibly happen in cinema was not to be found in this movie. And I've never watched it again. I never want to see it again. I never want to acknowledge it exists like pretty much every other person who was a Rambo fan, I guess. It yeah. feels like it's missing huge chunks of the film as well, though, doesn't it? It didn't make sense at all. No. It's like having the Mexican cartel that can, funnily enough, get into America really well with, like, 11 black... SUVs, vans. yeah. Yeah, SUVs. The whole story is about criminals coming over the border and you've just let 11 SUVs <laughs> packed with machine guns and everything through. And... It just, as I coined the term way before it became a meme, by the way, from someone else, I coined the term Home Stallone, mm -hmm. uh, which I did as soon as we walked out. I was like, that was like a Home Alone movie. You genuinely did, genuinely. you not making this up. We're not trying to lay claim Literally. to um, any kind of uh, memes or, or anything, but you genuinely said that when you came out. Yep, I did. I remember it clear as day, because then I saw someone do a meme of it, and I was like... Geez, that episode didn't even go out, but yeah, you know, they were all obviously over. I was right. And it's um, um I, I hate that movie. I, I remember really... you as well being it, it's horrible, but at the same time weirdly sanitized as well. Like the, everything that his his niece goes need I think it's his niece or whatever. I'm, I'm, I don't actually care. Um, but everything that she goes through is horrible. She gets kidnapped. Uh, um, she gets drugged. She gets thrown into this uh, uh, sex slave ring and then she ends up being given an overdose and she dies so it's like oh wow you really had it in for that character didn't you yeah you know and it changed my opinion of Stallone greatly yeah when I saw that movie because so I was like how could you put your name to this either you're really stupid or you really honestly believe that you, you don't have any positive Mexican characters in this movie. Actually, the only the only positive character that is in this movie is the maid. That's <laughs> well, it. Does, does that that speaks volumes. Something. Yeah. 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 But anyway, yeah. So it's like I said, it's also incredibly sanitized because right at the very end, he cuts yeah. a man's heart out and then pulls it from his chest, and you don't see anything. Nope. It's like it is gutless and it is full of those horrible CGI squibs that are, that that are just plugins from After Effects. And uh there's there's no kind of like realistic like gunshots if you look at what was in Rambo. All that looked like proper realistic, you know, someone's got a vest full of squibs on and there's explosions and spurts of blood going all over. The this just looked like they just filmed it where they fell down. And yeah. then they went, no, we'll put the blood in afterwards. Yeah. I was like, I mean, this movie is the most racist and xenophobic movie I think I had ever seen mm. at that point. And I've probably seen stuff worse. Mm -hmm. But it is horrible. Yeah. Hor a horrible piece of cinema, I think, it is. It's a crime of a movie. And uh, I don't care about the alternate version that came out where, you know, uh, they had an alternate opening where he saved some Mexican people. So it was like, yeah, you put that in last. Yeah, that was reshoots, <laughs> wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. That, that had to be reshoots because of the amount of shit that you guys got. 
we thought, oh yeah, we've, we've got to have him, let's go have him save some Mexicans. It's like that scene in Paul Haggis's Crash, where um, Brendan Fraser and uh, his wife, played by Sandra Bullock, get held up by two black thieves. And they're like, oh my God, you know, I've got a political campaign going on. Uh, so I, why in the hell did they have to be black? This is going to hurt me against the black vote. We need to have me pin a medal on a on a, a black veteran or you know a black disabled mm-hmm. guy or something like that. And that's exactly what it felt like when yeah. I heard about that scene putting on. I never went back to see it. Damage was done. And uh, that movie should just be flushed. Yes. That's my number one, which is really the biggest number two I've ever seen. Well, there's a lot there that I can agree with you with. Um, a lot of them I've seen as well. And uh, yeah, there's there's a lot of stinkers on that list. So if you've been listening to this and you've been feeling a little bit brought down by it all, I'm sorry. Go back and watch once. That will that'll cure everything. Yeah, or you could just do whatever comes from What's in the Box next. What's in the Box? What's in the box? What's in the box? What's in the box? Oh, yeah. Rambo. <laughs> yeah, I can't believe you just dragged me down with that. You've really got to come up with something so much better for next time. Yeah, well, I'm under the uh, the chopping block next time, though, aren't I? Oh, very true. Very oh, true. so, yeah, you're going to get your revenge. Up. I will, I will. I might get my revenge now because it's what's in the box. And what's in the box, Steve? It's usually when Andy has to pull out the name of a film that he certified fresh on Rotten Tomatoes out of a box. And if I haven't seen it, then I have to go away and watch it the day before we record our next episode. But if I have seen it, then we keep pulling out names of films until we find one that I haven't. That that sounds about right. That's about right, yeah. Okay, so Steve, are you ready for your what's in the box? (sighs) Okay. Okay. Hope it's as good as last uh, week's. I do have a feeling you may have seen this, though. So we have uh, Groundhog Day. Yes. Okay, so you've seen that. Yeah. There we go. Strike one. Okay, number two. Open it up. What do we have? Oh, American Beauty. You know, I was really hoping that you were going to go with the Groundhog Day joke and then just keep doing the same thing over and over again, but I'm glad that you didn't. Uh, American Beauty. No, I have not. Okay. I have wow. not, no. Kevin Spacey's kind of finest hour, mm. which uh, it's going to be very disturbing you watching this movie now, knowing what you know. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's a great movie, though. Sam Mendes, I think that was his first directed movie. Uh, it's, it's a great movie. It really is a great movie. Uh, great cast in it as well. I'm not going to spoil it for you, but uh, you're going to enjoy it, mm. I think. I know it's about midlife crisis and all the rest of it. So, Oh, it's yeah. perfect because we're already there. Oh, don't. Uh, don't. Please don't. Uh, you'll be uh, recreating the shower scene from this movie every day. Uh, what, sitting in it and being miserable and trying to drink coffee? Uh, Probably. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, you'll enjoy it anyway. Uh, so, oh my God, ladies and gentlemen, we, we are so thankful to be back. I know it's been a, a bit of a long episode today, but you know what? You've missed us. You deserve it. So why the hell not? Yes. And... Uh, no one listens to our bits anyway, so who cares? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You you guys all stop listening the moment that uh, Andy pulled the name of the film out. That's it. You're not listening anymore. Exactly. Well, if you haven't seen American Beauty, then watch it yourself. Oh, okay. Go buy it. Go to the pound store. You can get them for one pound nowadays. Yeah. It's more. <laughs> you can buy a DVD for a pound. I could hardly get a one pound for an option some days. Oh. Kim. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> well with that hanging over us thank you very much for listening um, I have been Steve Hester and I have been here this week yes uh, don't forget you can check us out on Facebook and Twitter both at Poddywood you can follow us on the, uh, the Poddywood subreddit or you can just you know stick a note to a carrier pigeon and then throw it out the window and see if it gets to us you can even find us on LinkedIn, which is a very popular base for us because mm. we're about the only fun people on LinkedIn that aren't trying to recruit for you mm. or design your website. <laughs> yes. Right. So it's a goodbye from me. And I will I guess I'll, I'll see you next week as well. I have to be here. Bye. <laughs> Yeah.
fancy the cheese casserole again. <laughs>